Thanks. So I'm Rajiv Hedja, um, co-director of NYU's Development Research Institute, alongside Bill Easterly and Nyarko. Um, and on behalf of the organizing committee um, of, of the Bread Conference, which included myself, uh, Stephen Anderson, uh, Andrela Dubey, Rohini Pandey, Bebraj Ray, Martin Rotenberg, and um, Mika Sviatsky. Uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to, to this year, uh, to, to this iteration of the, of the Bread Conference. W when uh, Bebraj and I long ago talked about hosting this conference at NYU, of course, you know, we were looking forward to the intellectual pleasure of bringing together a tremendous set of papers, uh, and of course, the, the additional pleasure of physically in bringing everybody to New York and hosting everyone here. Uh, while the latter pleasure uh, was unfortunately not realized, uh, at, at least the first is very much in evidence in, in an incredibly strong program over three days. So I think it's going to be um, uh, a lot of fun. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Mika, who's going to host, uh, who's going to chair the first session and will set the ground rules um, for us. Hi everyone, we are very happy to be hosting uh, this beginning of the, of the conference. So as a general rules here, you can use the chat question and answers. In general, we will only take clarifying questions very few because to be super short, but then we will have at the end of the session, the 20 minutes where we are going to get most of those questions and raising hands. Uh, all panelists are allowed to ask questions. Attendees, please feel free to send your questions if you have any to us or even to the panelists that are presenting. And I don't know if I'm missing anything, Martin, about the general rules, but I think uh, that's it. So let's get started. Erika, do you want to start sharing your screen? So we will have Erika Serrano, uh, who will be presenting Incentives in Multilayer Organization and Experiment in the Public Sector. This is joint work with Stefano Cario, Philippe Castro, and Gianmarco Leon. Um, thanks very much for having us. This is literally the first time I'm presenting this paper. Uh, so it's going, you know, it's super useful to get feedback. And I think Stefano and Gianmarco are there uh, on the chat if you have questions uh, for them. Also for me, obviously. But So let me start with the motivation. Um, so as most of you know, uh, large organizations are often divided in multiple hierarchical layers. Uh, and the efforts of workers in the different layers um, very often contribute to the production of final output. So what this means is that a worker can typically be efficient only if they have a good manager. And the effort of the manager can typically pay off only if workers are motivated. And so this raises a question, which is how should organization incentivize their workers among the, their different layers? And so this is the question we are going to ask uh, in our paper. And just for you to know, there is a vast lead theoretical literature that has analyzed um, the optimal allocation of incentive across layers. But empirically, there is a lack of evidence. And this is typically because um, the empirical evidence focuses on the effect of incentives in one layer of the hierarchy only. So we know the effect, what's the effect of incentives uh, among frontline workers. So for example, among teachers or among health workers. Uh, some papers have also analyzed the effect of incentive at the top of an organization. So the effect of incentives on managers, supervisors, CEOs, productivity and effort. Uh, but fewer papers have looked at both layer combined. And so what we do in this paper is that we leverage a field experiment and we write a, a model and we estimate a structural model to study the optimal allocation of incentive across layers. Now, the context is going to be one of a large public health organization in Sierra Leone, which is organized into teams that have two layers. So first, they're going to be frontline health workers, and I'll give you details on what these guys do exactly. And then on top, there are supervisors who monitor and train them. Uh, in this context, we are going to design an experiment where we create exogenous variation at the team level um, in the introduction of a new piece rate incentive that rewards output. And output is going to be a measure in terms of health, of health visit in our context. But importantly, we not only randomize the introduction of such piece rate, we actually randomize who receives the piece rate. So in one of our treatments, the money is going to go entirely to the workers. In the other treatment, it's going to go entirely to the supervisors. And then in the third treatment, it's going to be equally shared between the two, uh, between the two layers. And what we'll find, and I'll give you more detail you know, as the presentation goes, but what we'll find is that the shared incentives outperform one-side incentives by far. 
to try to understand why this is the case, we structurally estimate a model of service provision, and we show that this is because of two key factors. The first one is that we find that strong complementarity in worker and supervisor effort in our context, but also in many other contexts. And this is why it's actually inefficient to only incentivize one of the two layers. On top of that, um, we find large contractual frictions, which limit the redistribution of the incentive through site payments, and which makes it inefficient to give all the money to the supervisor and then ask them to redistribute. Now, both of these features are very common in organization, and we have a number of counterfactual exercises that show how they affect the optimal allocation of incentive in hierarchies. Um, so just before I go into the result, let me give you a bit more uh, context here. So the context is the community health program in Sierra Leone. This is a program that was set up to increase access to health services in rural areas. And the program is organized into teams, which technically are called peripheral health units. And each team is composed of an average of eight health workers who provide visits to households in their community. And typically those visits are focused on natal care, but they do other stuff as well. And then on top, there is one supervisor who train and monitor their health workers and who provides drugs uh, to, the health, to the health workers. Now, as many other contexts, this is a context with scope for complementarity. In fact, the success, the success of the program requires both the workers to be willing to work, but also to be able to work. And to be able to work, they need to be supervised uh, you know, in, an in an adequate way. Now, all workers here are going to be part-time workers who earn a fixed wage paid by the government, and it's a really pretty standard fixed wage for the context. Now, we're not going to touch at this fixed wage. What we do is that we work in a total of 372 areas in Sierra Leone, which span the whole country. And in those areas, we introduce a new incentive scheme, which pays 2,000 leons, which is roughly 25 cents, for each household visit provided by, the, by a health worker. But crucially, what we do is that we randomize who gets the incentive. So in 93 areas, the incentive is entirely paid to the, uh, to the health worker who provides the service. So in other words, I provide a service and I get 2,000 leons for that service. In the supervisor incentive treatment, which happened in a different 93 uh, geographical areas, the incentive is paid entirely to the supervisor. So basically, if a health worker provides a service, the money goes entirely to the supervisor. We also have a shared incentive treatment where the money is equally shared between the worker and the supervisor. So each of them receive a thousand neons and then a control group where there are no incentive, which is the status quo. Now, just a few things here. To make the incentive credible, the money was paid by a reputable external organization that was able to pay on time and every month to make it really credible to such that the health workers see the money coming frequently. Um, and they're paid based on an SMS reporting system. So the way it works is that each time a health worker provides a service, that service needs to be reported by SMS to a toll-free number in which they indicate the name and the contact number of the patient and the service they provided. Now, to limit over-reporting uh, and to limit collusion between the supervisor and the manager, we did a number of back checks. Effectively, what we did is that we contacted back the patients and we made sure they received the service. And uh, I'll show you, in fact, we have almost no over-reporting in our setting. We only see under-reporting, but I'll come to that later. Now, what we told the supervisors and workers is that, can openly, that they can freely transfer part of their incentive to the other layer at their discretion. But as I'll show you, we effectively, we see very few site drive payments, um, site transfers. Um, when we do observe them, they're always from supervisors to workers. And this is going to be in line with the presence of, of contractual friction, uh, which I'll go through in the model. Now, very quickly, data is pretty standard. Uh, we surveyed all um, staff at baseline and at the end line. So 3,000 work and, and uh, for, uh, roughly 400 supervisors. The end line takes place a year and a half after the introduction of the incentive, and it allows us to measure site payments, quality, and quantity of supervision. Now, to measure the quantity and the quality of visits given by the health workers, which is our main output measure here, we didn't rely on self-reported data. We actually went and collected data from the household to basically ask them how many times they were visited, the kind of visit they received, and the quality of those visits. Uh, and we also have data on SMS reports. 
So to guide the empirical results, we have a model. It's a very simple model, uh, which gives us some important intuition on trying to understand the mechanism behind our results. So I'll just go very quickly here to just give you the main intuition of the model. It's long and more complicated in the paper, but I don't need you to get all the details. So in the model, um, a front, there is a frontline worker and a supervisor who choose effort, A1 and A2, to produce output. And output here is X, it's in the number of household visits. Now, importantly in the model, efforts can be strategic complements or, or substitutes. So basically we write output as a function of the effort here. And you see this formula, uh, they're going to be complements if gamma is strictly positive. Both agents, workers and supervisors are going to be paid an incentive based on visits and the organization, their goal is going to choose the share of the incentive assigned to the worker, which we're going to call P, such as output is maximized. So effectively here, the level of the incentive is fixed, 2000 leons in our case, in our empirical setting. And what the organization does is to decide what share P is goes to the worker and what share one minus P goes to the supervisor. And I'll skip the details of the timing and also force, but basically the key, you know, the key result is the optimal contract P is going to be a function of two key parameters. It's going to be a function of the extent to which there, effort, there is effort complementarity, but it's also going to be a function of contractual frictions. In the model, contractual frictions make site payments from supervisors to worker costly, and they limit the scope for equation bargaining. So very, very intuitively, what we get from the model is the following. We get that if you're in a situation, so this is the first panel, if you're in a situation with no friction and no effort complementarity, it shouldn't really matter how you redistribute the incentive. In fact, the number of visits is going to be the same regardless of P. And this is because workers can simply reallocate and redistribute the incentive from top to bottom layer and vice versa. And so really how you share doesn't matter for output. Uh, if you're in a situation with a strong effort complementarity and without frictions, it's going to be optimal to give all the money to the supervisor. If instead you're in a situation with friction but without complementarity, it's going to instead be optimal to give all the money to the worker. What's important to understand here is that the only case where it's going to be optimal to share the incentive between the two layer is going to be a case where you have both contractual friction and effort complementarity. And this is exactly the situation we see in the data. So now I'm going to go to the result and I'll come back to basically the fact that a shared incentive treatment is optimal only if you're in a situation with contractual friction and effort complementarity in the model. So let me show you the main results. So here I'm back to the result. So what you see here is the difference between the worker, the supervisor, and the shared incentive treatment relative to the control group um, on the number of visits. So this is the number of visits a household has received um, um, a household had received in the six months before the end line. And this is reported by the household. And so what you see is that any of our treatments, any of our piece rate incentive schemes increases output increases the number of visits. But the shared incentive treatment does twice as well as the one side incentive treatment. So this is really saying the shared incentive treatment outperforms in terms of number of visits. Now, this is not only the case for number of visits. In fact, we also look at visit quality um, measured with the length of the visit, the type of topics discussed. We also look at trust that households have towards the workers. And finally, we look at access to pre and postnatal care and disease incidents. And we see that along all these dimensions, the shared incentive treatment does better. So it seems to outperform the one side incentives. Now, obviously, one question here is that, you know, output seems to be increased with shared incentives, but there is also a question of cost of these incentives. And remember that the cost depend on how much, you know, how many visits are actually reported by the health workers. And what we see, which is not surprising, is that the higher is the incentive the health worker earns, the higher is the incentive to report the system. And so effectively, what we end up seeing is the following. While the worker and the supervisor incentives lead to the same output, this is something I showed you before, um, the, the worker incentives cost more money because the workers will have a higher incentive to report and they report more. 
So overall, what we see is that the two one-sided incentives achieve the same output, but the worker incentive costs twice as much due to less underreporting. And so overall, if one thinks of, of cost effectiveness, the shared incentive seems to do better than the supervisor incentive, which seems to do better than the worker incentive. Here I'm talking about cost effectiveness, not about worker welfare. But I can talk about this um, uh, on the side later um, uh, if you want. So just in terms of the mechanism, why are the shared incentives so effective? So why is it the case that it seems to be so much more effective to share the incentive between the worker and the supervisors than to give the incentive to only one of the two layers? Now, the model suggests that this is because we are in a situation with both contractual frictions and effort complementarities. And indeed, we can actually prove empirically that both of these components are present in our empirical setting. Now, to show that there are contractual frictions, we can do a number of tests, but I think the easiest test to understand in the 20 minute presentation is the fact that we see that actually the frequency and the intensity of site payments are minimal in our setting. So we do see that there are more site payments from supervisors to workers in the supervisor incentive treatment. But even in that treatment, less than 20% of the supervisors make any transfer to workers suggesting contractual frictions. Now, to test for effort complementarities, we have a mediation analysis, we have different analyses in the paper, but I think this probably, this figure is, uh, is, is the easiest to explain, uh, you know, quickly, um, and is the one that provides some of, you know, the more convincing evidence. So without complementarities, what you should expect is the effort of the supervisor to monot mon monotonically increasing with supervisor incentives. So here, what we do is we look at the effect of our treatment on an effort index of the supervisors. So this is an index of different measures, different ways of measuring supervisor effort and supervisor's productivity. And what you see is that actually the effort of the supervisors is the same in the supervisor incentive and the shared incentive treatment. And this is despite the fact that in the shared incentive, the, ince the, the money the supervisors directly get from the organization is half of the money they get from the supervisor incentive treatment. So this is in line with the presence of, uh, of effort Complementarity. So overall, you know, we see that the shared incentive treatment outperform and it's consistent with the presence of effort complementarity and contractual friction happening in our context. Now, there are two uh, alternative mechanisms uh, which, which we can rule out and which I'll quickly talk about, which I'll quickly uh, go through. So the first mechanism is one of non-linearities in the utility or the cost function. So the idea here is simple. Uh, it's basically the idea is that the shared incentive um, treatment can be very efficient, even in the absence of complementarities, if the marginal utility uh, uh, generated from the incentive sharply, uh, sharply drops, sharply um, uh, rapidly declines at a level of 1,000 leons, which is the level we give in the in the shared incentive treatment. But we can easily show that such you know such concavity in the utility function or such sharp convexity in the cost function do not seem to be present in our context. Um, the other thing uh, that can explain our result is aversion to pay inequality. So the one side incentives can be you know, can be inefficient if the, in, if the part of the, if the layer that is not incentivized is pissed off that they don't get any money what the other layer gets money. Um, this is also unlikely in our context because actually very few of our frontline workers are aware of the presence of a supervisor incentives. We didn't tell them about the presence of such incentive and the, such the information diffused, uh, didn't diffuse much. In fact, at the end line, less than 5% knew the exact amount of the supervisor incentive and very often this was underestimated. So just very brief on the structure model and then I'll conclude. Um, we, 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 we write so a model which we structurally estimate using a classical minimum distance estimator and using moments of our data capturing visits and supervisor effort in each treatment group. Now reassuringly, the estimated model uh, precisely reproduces the key finding and it confirms strong effort complementarity and large contractual friction in our setting. In fact, we estimate that complementarity raises the return to worker effort by 20%. And we also estimated that to generate a transfer of one unit from the supervisors to the worker, this costs five units to the supervisors, so strong contractual frictions. 
Now, the model allows us to do, uh, the, the structural model allows us to do a number of things. Um, one of them is to estimate the optimal incentive. So the optimal share of the incentive that should go to the worker and that should go to the supervisor. And what we estimate is that, that the optimal share that goes to the worker should be 54%, which is very close to our shared incentive treatment. And so this is saying really in a context with both complementarity and frictions, the optimal share is one which roughly equally divides the incentive between the two layers. Now, obviously this optimal share depends on the amount of effort complementarity in your organization. So if you move from our organization to organization that have lower effort complementarity, so go think of an organization where there are literally almost no effort complementarities between the two layers. Well, in that case, it's going to be optimal to give a higher share of the incentive to workers rather than to give a higher share of the incentive to supervisors. If you move to organization that have more complementarity than in our setting, it's going to be optimal to give more of the share of the uh, larger share of the incentive to the supervisors. Uh, we have other counterfactual policies uh, in the paper, but I'm going, uh, I'm done, so I need to conclude here. So let me conclude by saying the following things. Um, in developing countries, but also generally when you think of public service delivery, most pay for performance scheme tend to incentivize frontline workers rather than their supervisors. So if you think of performance scheme that pays teacher or performance scheme that pay health workers or bureaucrat, a lower level bureaucrat, I mean, this is typically, you know, schemes that give an incentive to the bottom tier of the organization while giving no incentive to the upper tier directly or not, not in the same way. Uh, what we show in this paper paper is that when there is effort complementarities and contractual friction, this may be inefficient. In fact, we have 60%, we obtain 60% higher output when the incentive is shared between the two layers than if the incentive is given only to the, to the, bottom, to the bottom layer. So overall, this is saying organizations should really take into account the extent of complementarity and the extent of contractual frictions to shape uh, and, to, and to decide on the optimal allocation of, it, of incentive if that organization is multi-layered. Um, I spoke quick, I spoke fast, uh, but thank you very much uh, and comments uh, and suggestions are very welcome. Great, thank you so much Erika for presenting this interesting paper. So we got a lot of questions but we will leave it for the end so that everyone has uh, the opportunity to have the time to present. Some of them were already answered by your co-authors so that will give us time for the end. So thank you my co <laughs> So now we have Diana Moreira presenting civil service reform and organizational practice, evidence from the Pedantal Act. Okay, great. So I will be presenting a joint work with uh, Santiago Perez, um, who is here and he is available for answering uh, questions in the chat. The title is Civil Service Reform and Organizational Practices. Um, okay, so let me jump straight to the motivation. So. We, uh, so the main idea is that, uh, you know, well-functioning bureaucracies are increasingly seen as a key determinant for economic development. Uh, um, uh, and basically the standard recipe for achieving uh, a, a professionalized bureaucracy is through the enactment uh, of civil service reform. That's uh, with, you know, taking uh, across developing and developed countries that seem to be the main recipe. The main channel that we believe these uh, reforms operate is that they attract and retain more qualified employees, which then translate uh, to better bureaucracy performance. Now, while reforms sometimes improve performance, they're generally perceived to be no silver bullet. So in an assessment of 71 reforms funded by the World Bank, only 42% uh, were rated as uh, successful. Moreover, there is very little evidence uh, that reforms actually affect personal outcomes, despite the fact that this is kind of the main channel to which reforms should be operating. And in fact, recent evidence actually cast doubt on whether uh, this is an important channel. Um, so we believe that uh, uh, basically bringing uh, data on personal records allow us to uh, open the black box of the bureaucracy, which can, uh, 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 which enable us to explain these varying uh, degrees of success. And that's where uh, we are heading uh, with this paper. So we ask how the, the 18, 18, 18, 
1963, uh, sorry, Pennington Act, impact the functioning uh, of the US uh, collection districts. Uh, two qualifications. So we are looking at the Pennington Act, which is basically a landmark legislation in the US, which was the first attempt to implement a merit system uh, in the US uh, federal government. Uh, and we use, uh, we look at this reform uh, in, in a particular context, which is uh, basically looking at uh, a particular organization inside the, the federal bureaucracy, which is the US collection districts. Uh, so the collection districts had a, a key uh, role uh, at the time, which was to collect uh, import duties. This represented basically 50% of all the revenue that was collected at the federal, uh, uh, for the federal government at that time. So they were playing a key uh, uh, important role at that time. Uh, now, what the act did was basically to introduce mandatory exams for a selection, uh, for the selection of some federal employees. Uh, and basically what we, we used was the fact that districts with more than 50 employees, uh, uh, basically by 83, by the time of the reform, hire for some positions using exams. So they were mandated to, to hire for these positions using exams. While districts that were smaller, up to 49 workers, there was no change whatsoever. So what we did was to compare reformed and unreformed districts before and after the reform. Uh, and uh, importantly, so basically what, uh, you know, the main advantage of, of the paper is that we are uh, bringing uh, new data which allows to, to bring new insight to this old question. Uh, and in particular, we digitalize uh, these two sets of data. So basically, uh, these um, personal records that enable us to look at the whole structure of each uh, individual working uh, in these uh, districts, the district that they work, the occupation that these individuals have, and uh, the compensation. So we can uh, study the structure of, of these districts. And uh, we uh, also link uh, these uh, personal records to population census. So we can recover some of the characteristics of these individuals prior to actually entering uh, in the bureaucracy. We, complement that with uh, data on uh, the performance of these uh, districts, basically looking at uh, receipts and, and expenses uh, for each of these districts, uh, looking at a span of 20 years. Uh, and so basically, that's the main, uh, the key uh, uh, element that we add and in, in allow to revisit uh, this old question. So let me talk about uh, the historical background. So we uh, look at, um, as I said, US custom services. So the main function of these districts were uh, basically to collect import duties. This uh, consists of a complex process of appraising goods and categorizing uh, each good into the tariff structure is of course prone of, uh, to errors uh, and, and a lot of scope for uh, corruption. Uh, this makes reformers, usually uh, they would attribute, uh, you know, that the US had a very high cost to collect. And they would argue that uh, this is due to the fact that there was a lack of merit system relative to other countries that had already enacted uh, reforms. And in the paper, we have several quotes emphasizing that. The key kind of uh, channels that uh, usually people would argue that and the appointment based on, on political cons considerations uh, would limit uh, the effectiveness of, of these collection districts were basically because there was an overstaffing, corruption, careless. Uh, all of these would contribute to, to worse performing districts. And overall, the conventional wisdom is really that th these reforms were super successful to uh, actually improve uh, uh, performance. And we will tell a story that is slightly different than that. Um, okay, so the empirical strategy, so we'll be using, um, you know, a very simple uh, difference and difference analysis, uh, where we are interested in this beta coefficient that basically captures uh, the uh, changing trajectory uh, of the, our outcome variables uh, in these reformed uh, collection districts relative to the unreformed uh, collection districts. Uh, and for the notation, so we call this reform collection districts as this uh, classified uh, districts. Uh, importantly, these classified districts, they are kept, uh, you know, the same across the whole sample. So it's basically determined by the size uh, of that 
collection district at baseline. Uh, and we are interested uh, in understanding how the, it changes the trajectory uh, once you enact uh, the reform relative to, to the uh, unreformed districts. Um, the effect, also let's start with the effect on personal outcomes. So the main uh, argument is that by enacting the merit reform, you can potentially uh, you know, reduce the incentives of hiring uh, your colleagues, uh, which uh, probably reduce the incentives of firing uh, uh, because you cannot uh, put in place uh, your own people. So may uh, reduce turnover. At the same time, it increases the weight you put in skills relative uh, to connections, and, uh, and the claim you would increase uh, uh, the qualifications of employees. Uh, now, the reform not necessarily has to work that way, right? So it could uh, it could go uh, in the opposite direction. So what we do uh, is to ask whether the reform indeed led to search personnel outcomes. Uh, and we look at two uh, uh, primary outcomes. So ter first, turnover, which is the percentage of personnel who leave that district two years uh, after uh, uh, every, every two years, right? Uh, and then we look at employees' qualification. So we uh, study uh, what is the occupation uh, of, of bureaucrats, of future bureaucrats, prior to joining the bureaucracy. And, and in particular, we are interested in whether it changes uh, uh, the, the share of professionals, individuals who had a professional job, for example, relative to unskilled or having a, a no occupation. Um, so, the, so that's the first result. So we find in the y-axis is turnover. So in general, what we see is that a 40, there is a 40% chance of individuals living uh, uh, for uh, in the next two years, living these districts. And we see that the, the blue and the orange kind of follow each other up to the reform. And then after the reform, what happens is that the blue continues spiking. So it continues uh, you know, growing uh, while the orange remains uh, shielded from, from uh, this increasing turnover. Uh, and this is particularly uh, important when there is a, a political transition. Um, and so this actually confirms, so we see that in general, there is a, a 12 percentage points increase in, in, the, uh, in the turnover. This is particularly prevalent when there is a, a political transition at the federal level. And uh, uh, this uh, also happens uh, more uh, pronouncedly uh, in, uh, in, in places, uh, in, in positions that are subject to exam relative to other positions in those districts that are not uh, subject uh, to exam. Then we turn uh, to the qualifications of these individuals. So what we see is that there is increase uh, in, in, in the share of individuals that hold a professional uh, occupation. So it increased by six uh, percentage points, uh, the, uh, the share of new hires that are actually, uh, that hold a professional occupation. And this is again, is concentrated uh, among new hires that are uh, uh, subject uh, to the exam. Uh, now, the, the improvement is particularly uh, pronounced uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in these individuals that are subject to exam, and we don't see much happening uh, you know, across if you, we pull all workers, which, which would make sense. And interestingly, uh, what we see is that this uh, increasing in professional, uh, in professional jobs, uh, individuals who hold a professional job, uh, prior to joining the bureaucracy is completely compensated by having less uh, unskilled and, and, and less individuals that had declared no occupation whatsoever. And so it seems really an improvement in, in terms of uh, the qualifications of these individuals. Um, Okay, so then, you know, the next step is what happens to cost effectiveness. So it seems to, to improve personal outcomes, what happens uh, to cost effectiveness. So we look at, uh, this is a measure uh, of uh, cost effectiveness, which is uh, the recipes collected relative uh, to the expenses. Uh, and in, in the y uh, axis here, and so what we see is that there is not much of a change in terms of the trajectories uh, uh, that we observe uh, with respect to, to the unclassified, the unreformed uh, collection districts. Um, the, uh, and this is also the case, this limited uh, effect is also the case if we look separately, if we look just 
for uh, the revenues that is being collected, the expense, or opening up, uh, you know, by the type of expenses also, uh, that is, that doesn't seem to be a, a, a very large uh, increase. So overall, the, the reform had limited effect on revenues, uh, and the effect size is small, uh, and, and that's uh, uh, primarily uh, what we, we observe. Uh, now, the districts, you know, may have improved other margins that we cannot really measure. So, for example, faster, they could be, have become faster in clearing ports and so on. Uh, now, we acknowledge that, you know, the, the primary goal of these districts are really uh, a revenue collection. Uh, and so it seems natural to look at, at that uh, at margin. Uh, and also uh, the fact that the results so far suggest one path uh, for which revenue should be increasing, right? So the reform had the intended effect on personal outcomes. And at the same time, uh, we see a strong relationship. So uh, a collection districts that actually prior to the reform experience increase in individuals with professional background actually is associated with uh, increasing in revenue. So there, there seem to be kind of a, a, a natural mechanism for uh, having this increase in, in outcomes. Uh, and so the question is, why did the reform not improve uh, cost effectiveness? Uh, and, and, and that's where uh, we go next. Uh, so we uh, explore some uh, uh, explanations that we find limited support uh, for. So for example, spillovers from classified to non-classified districts, this doesn't seem to explain. Uh, we also look at the adjustment cost. So it could be that, well, it takes more than 10 years for the, the reform to actually uh, be effective, right? So we look at in a 20 years horizon and still uh, there is a very limited effect on, on cost effectiveness. Uh, we present evidence consistent uh, with a story of fixed middle broken tails, uh, which uh, shows a, a key role of the non-merit hires within these reform districts. So besides the, the occupations that were subject to exam, there were uh, positions that were exempted. So employees making at the bottom of the hierarchy, making uh, uh, up to $900, as well as leadership positions were exempted uh, from, uh, from the reform. And we will see that they play, uh, they might uh, have played a role that explains, at least in part, uh, uh, the lack of effectiveness. But of course, we acknowledge that there could be other hard to test mechanisms that uh, we are not claiming that this fully explains uh, the lack of effectiveness. Um, so we we first look at the uh, percent, so uh, the you know the share of individuals that are in position exempted from exam. So what we see is that there is a huge spike right after the reform. So the orange line starts uh, you know increasing. Uh, way more than the blue line. Uh, and so it represents that there is a reallocation in terms of the jobs, uh, the occupations within these this collection districts. Uh, and in fact, what we see is that all this reallocation is actually happening at the bottom of the hierarchy. So what seems to be happening is that, you know, the, in terms of the leadership positions, it, it's kept the same, but they are increasing uh, a lot the number of individuals that are in um, uh, in low paying positions. And that's actually, so it's increasing the share of individuals in these positions, uh, and which is basically distorting uh, 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 the structure of, of these uh, uh, collection districts. And we see that it seems that over time, they're kind of like taking every opportunity that they have to hire new individuals to kind of increase this share going from uh, about 10% to about 30% uh, of these positions uh, uh, in low paying jobs. Um, and now, and so of course we argue that uh, this reallocation is costly, right? So it can be costly because of two reasons. So uh, you can imagine that if we force it to pay less than, uh, than a certain amount, uh, you will recruit potentially individuals with worse qualifications, uh, right? So these individuals uh, may have a weaker uh, professional background and, and actually is correlated uh, in the data. Uh, uh, the, the lower pay uh, with, uh, with the professional uh, background. Uh, and second, we are actually distorting uh, the, the structure of these districts. Now, you end up with a bunch of folks kind of making very little money and, and perhaps the mid 
uh, mid-tier of the bureaucracy is empty, kind of you don't no longer have clerks, inspectors, examiners that were uh, making like a key uh, 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 task that is no longer uh, gets done or gets done uh, imperfectly. Uh, and so we argue that this uh, has consequences uh, for, for the performance. Uh, second, we turn uh, to uh, to collectors, uh, uh, which is basically uh, the uh, you know the leadership position. So what we see is that there is a lot of this distortion at the bottom. What happened uh, to the top, right? So we look at uh, uh, the key uh, uh, individual that controls. Uh, uh, you know, is the top uh, at the hierarchy of uh, of collection uh, um, of collection districts. And this individual actually remain uh, to be uh, an exempted uh, a position. So they remain to be a, a political appointees. Uh, and so uh, the question is whether this represented a missed opportunity. So if, uh, for example, if they facilitated the reallocation that we observe, or if they, they are so important that they, they basically, uh, uh, if they basically, uh, you know, have key, uh, very high stakes decisions to make that are super important for cost effectiveness. In both of these cases, we are basically having a missed opportunity for influencing who is actually the, uh, the uh, in this position, right? So what we implement is basically two strategies to get at how important uh, were uh, the collectors in, in this setting and how much it represents a missed opportunity, the fact that we couldn't influence actually who are the collectors. So first, we use a collector fixed effect. So both strategies are, to, are imperfect in, in its own way. So the first, we use collector fixed effect, uh, and we test for whether you know the, uh, the F test, so whether uh, all these uh, collector fixed effects are jointly uh, zero. Um, and of course, that's problematic because there is. A, a, uh, issues with uh, why collectors are coming in and why collectors are coming out, right? Uh, and so we turn uh, to the second strategy, which is uh, we, we explore collectors' death in office. Uh, and so we uh, implement Jones and Oaken's uh, uh, strategy of uh, a test on, on excess variance around collectors' death. Uh, and we uh, we check whether uh, you know around the collector's death there is an excess variation uh, in the outcomes of interest. Uh, and the main limitation here is the number of collectors' uh, deaths that we observe that happens while the collector is in office, which is uh, only twenty eight uh, deaths. Um, and so we combine uh, these two strategies. So actually, both strategies suggest that collectors matter for uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, and so let me just conclude. So overall, uh, what we uh, what we see is that uh, basically, uh, you know, well functioning uh, uh, bureaucracies seems, you know, remain an elusive goal for many developing countries. We believe that the historical uh, U.S. experience uh, it's quite interesting to understand how you can transition from uh, you know a patronage system to a, a professional bureaucracy. Uh, we look at the first attempt in the US to actually implement uh, such a uh, reform. Uh, what we find is that the act actually led to better personnel outcomes, but limited the effect, uh, but it had limited effect on cost effectiveness. Uh, we argue that there are two broad implications. So first, uh, you know, reforms uh, are implemented, uh, uh, reforms like this one are implemented throughout in the world. Uh, and what we show is that even a parsimonious reform, that there is no tenure, no, uh, uh, you know, prohibition of political dismissals, is still managed to kind of improve qualifications and reduce uh, turnover. So that's, that's a plus. On the other hand, our, you know, the role played by the no-merit hires uh, and, and the distortion that we document uh, actually adds some caveat on the design of this reform. So it really shows that one must consider the incentives of all involved actors uh, in these reforms. Uh, and in particular, so basically, 
the distortions we document probably was against the spirit, the intent of, of the reforms, but were within the rules of the game. And we argue that uh, basically uh, reformers should internalize or to the extent possible limit these unintended organizational changes that the reform promote. Uh, in the same way that you know it's parallel to how loopholes in tax systems and gaming pay, pay for performance kind of becomes an integral part of the system uh, once you, you enact uh, these changes. And so reformers should be uh, thinking about these potentially distortions that could happen a, as part of, of the, the reform itself. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, for presenting this paper. So now we will move to Sangyon Park, who will be presenting technology, training, buyer supplier linkage, and quality upgraded in an agriculture supply chain. Um, this is joint work with uh, Zhao Neng and Hong Song at the Uni University of Hong Kong. Um, okay, so to quickly motivate, um, globalization and international trade uh, we saw in the past decades opened up vast opportunities for uh, farmers and producers to access and export to high income countries. Um, and this can be an important channel of growth, especially for uh, developing economies. However, studies show that qu quality is a major barrier for producers in developing countries um, in realizing these um, export opportunities. The literature also documents several challenges and constraints on both supply and demand sides. Uh, gov we, saw gov we see government policies typically aiming and focusing on reducing the supply side constraints. For example, by providing training on technology, subsidizing R&D, and also uh, provi providing uh, loans for investment However, another important constraint in quality upgrading uh, is asymmetric information and distrust on product quality. And these can dampen incentives to, for producers to upgrade quality. Um, this problem might be more severe uh, in developing countries where quality verification can be more costly and difficult, um, and also where there might be lack of formal contract enforcement. So in this paper, we examine the impacts of technology training on quality upgrading uh, we provide training on good agricultural practices, which is a technology uh, designed to improve food safety, in particular uh, pesticide use. Uh, we designed this program uh, so that it's offered not only to farmers, but also export intermediaries, because we want to encourage uh, downstream buyers to also participate in the training program. Um, so how do we do this? We conduct a uh, randomized control trial in the dragon food supply chain which is uh, one of the largest export agricultural supply chains in Vietnam. So we first uh, matched farmers and export intermediaries into clusters uh, based on geographical distance. And then we randomly assigned them to different treatment group uh, arms. So we have the control group where we didn't provide any training. In the farmer training group, we provided training to only farmers. In the intermediary training uh, group, we only invited intermediaries to take part, but not the farmers. And finally, the joint training group, we, invite, we invited both farmers and export intermediaries to participate in the, in the program together. So uh, here are the main findings. So first we find that farmer training does improve product quality uh, measured by uh, different um, ways. But we find that the, the impacts are much larger when uh, farmers are trained and uh, export intermediaries also participated in the training program. We also find that uh, joint training increases trade, in particular uh, contract trading between farmers and participating buyers, and also find that uh, these, these type of trades have higher price returns to quality. We, uh, we uh, find evidence to support that one of the key mechanisms that drive these large effects when uh, buyers participate in the program is because uh, buyer participation can mitigate distrust on quality between uh, producers and buyers, and that, lead, that facilitates uh, contract trading, which also has high returns to quality. Okay, so I'll skip the e literature uh, in the interest of time. So for those who don't know what a dragon fruit is, uh, this is a picture from the Wikipedia page. Um, basically the exterior uh, resembles a dragon fruit. So it has red skin and the green scales. Um, it's a perennial fruit crop, uh, typically harvested about twice a year. And it's one of the most popular cash crops grown by smallholder farmers in Vietnam. Um, okay, so uh, this is a picture, uh, a figure of the dragon fruit supply chain in Binh Thuong province, which is uh, where we conducted the study. 
So producers are mostly smallholder farmers um, who would uh, typically sell their fruit to local collectors who are middlemen. So uh, they would uh, basically, there would almost be no contracting. So local collectors would visit the farms typically right before the harvest and they would just bargain on the price. And then the local collectors will buy the fruit and sell it directly to these export intermediaries or export enterprises who would then uh, clean the fruit, pack it, and then sell it to overseas buyers. So uh, in this supply chain, typically the export enterprises uh, would have contracts with the, the foreign buyers. Um, and most of the, the largest market is, is the Chinese market, about 90%. And um, the Asian countries, excluding China and the rest, uh, consist a smaller fraction of exports of dragon fruits. So one reason why uh, most of the products are exported to China might be a uh, demand side issue. So there's more demand from China. But um, if you look at reports, uh, there might be uh, quality might not be might be another barrier uh, from entering these high price markets. So if you look at customs data, price of exports to these other countries are typically three to seven times higher than the price of exports to China. And studies also report substantial violations of regulations on pesticide or, or, or farming practices of dragon fruits. So um, these are suggestive that uh, um, the quality of the fruit is indeed a barrier for uh, from entering these markets. Uh, and this coincides with what uh, government reports within Vietnam show that um, there's a prevalence of pesticide abuse in the agriculture sector. So in Bintuang province, a uh, report finds that about 86% of fruit and vegetable samples contained uh, pesticides that were illegal for, for agricultural use. Um, there are several contributing factors to pesticide abuse. Uh, one is the presence of low quality and counterfeit uh, pesticides on the market. Um, obviously, if uh, low, low, in, low quality inputs can uh, lead to low quality outputs, but other reasons include uh, farmers may have limited knowledge on pesticide and also information about export regulations. Another reason is uh, there might be uh, pervasive distrust on quality and contracting between farmer, farmers and exporting intermediaries. So uh, we provided training on good agricultural practices uh, in our experiment. Um, so we uh, randomly se selected farmer groups from a list that was registered with our local partner. Uh, we recruited export intermediaries through a search and recruitment drive uh, about a year before our intervention. So uh, about two thirds of the export intermediaries in the area showed interest in participating in our program. So our main sample consists of 80 clusters. So these are matched uh, of farmer groups and export intermediaries uh, and have about 1100 uh, farmers and about uh, 230 export intermediaries. We randomly assigned them to different treatment arms. So each in equal proportion. So each treatment arm has about 22 clusters, uh, 250 to 300 farmers and about 50 export intermediaries. Okay, so uh, we partnered with the uh, Bintuang Dragon Fruit Development Research Center. That was our local uh, collaborator. Um, they, had, they had close connections with farmers and also a list of farmer groups. Um, the staff there uh, actually developed the training materials and also delivered the, the, the instructed the training sessions, which lasted for three days. So we had lectures, focus group discussions, and uh, had a field demonstration. One of the key components of this training was uh, providing information on food safety and also uh, practical instructions about uh, providing field demonstrations and instructions uh, about uh, applica application of pesticides throughout the production cycle. Okay, so here's a timeline of our experiment. Um, so we first conducted the baseline surveys at the end of 2018. Uh, in surveys, we asked farms and firm, firm characteristics, their trade and business uh, practices, uh, and was followed by uh, training sessions. About six months later, we conducted our first follow-up survey. And another six months later, later we conducted our second, second follow-up survey. So the interval of six months was time so that um, a farmer would have at least one harvest season uh, in between those uh, surveys. Uh, we collect data on production, trade, and sales information. Uh, we test farmers' uh, knowledge and awareness. And because uh, this paper was on uh, product quality, we tried to be as much as careful as possible when measuring it. So we have we conducted uh, on-farm audits by experts on gap compliance. So we consider this as more as an input side measure of product quality. Uh, we also conducted pesticide residue tests at ISO certified laboratories. Um, so this uh, we can consider a more as an output side measure of product quality. Unfortunately, because of budget limits, uh, we could only conduct it with about one quarter of our entire farmer sample. But uh, if we see the correlation between the gap audit score and also the pesticide residue test, 
we find strong correlations suggesting that the input side measure is actually uh, very much predictive of the output side measure. Uh, and additionally, additionally, we also conducted a product assessment, which was um, trying to assess the observable quality, quality of the product. So we measure the fruit sweetness, uh, skin condition, size, and weight. So I'll skip the summary statistics. So uh, for the analysis, we follow our pre-analysis plan. So we have a linear specification with indicators of each of the tra uh, tra uh, training treatments. Our outcome, main outcome measure is going to be product quality uh, measured in the follow-up surveys and also farm gate performance. Um, we include uh, baseline farmer and intermediate characteristics as controls and include strata and survey around fixed effects. Um, for uh, identification, uh, we conduct a balance check using farmer and intermediate characteristics and shows that it's well balanced across the treatment arms. And we report p-values based on randomization inference tests. Okay, so here's the summary of the main findings. So after 12 months, 12 months after training, we find that farmer training uh, improves uh, uh, quality of the fruit uh, measured using the gap audit. Uh, but we find that that effect, that improvement in quality upgrading is actually more uh, significant uh, when uh, farmers were trained and there was also uh, participation uh, from downstream buyers in the joint training group. Um, results are consistent if we use the, the mean pesticide level. So one unit here uh, corresponds to one maximum residue limit, which is um, basically the maximum tolerance level of a pesticide. So the magnitudes here suggest that uh, for farmer training, there was about a 30% uh, So the control group had on average had about 1.4 units. So this is, the farmer training reduces about 30% uh, uh, compared to control group and the joint training uh, suggests that um, pesticide residue falls by about 50%. Uh, if you look at the difference in the coefficients between farmer training and joint training, um, it is significant for uh, gap audit, but because we have a smaller sample for pesticide, uh, the, 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 the significance is, is, is smaller. If we look at farm gate performance, uh, surprisingly, we don't find much of a improvement for a farmer training group. So price increases, but not significantly, and profit, if anything, shows a negative sign. However, if you look at joint training, we do see a significant increase in farm gate price by about 11.5%, and profit also increases by almost uh, 10%. And here, uh, the, the, the coefficients are significantly different between th these two training groups. And so here, uh, we want to address two uh, main questions. So what are the mechanisms behind the effects of training? And also, what explains the larger effect we observe when there is buyer participation in the training program? And we think these are important for policy implication because uh, uh, these mechanisms can help us better design uh, intervention that targets uh, uh, improving uh, quality upgrading. So we empirically document two important mechanisms. The first is knowledge transfer. So we find that training farmers improves uh, farmers' knowledge on quality enhancing technology. Um, and we also find, uh, and, and the second mechanism is buyer supply linkage. So buyer participation boosts trade between farmers and participating export intermediaries. And these trade are more likely characterized by higher price returns to quality and also informal contracting. And uh, one of the, the mechan and one of the reasons why we do why we think we see boost of trade is because uh, the buyer participation mitigated distrust and quality on both uh, uh, from both uh, the farmer side and also the export intermediary side. Okay, so uh, just quickly going over each mechanism. So uh, we conducted, a, we tested farmer's knowledge and intermediate knowledge. So we do find that farmer knowledge improves from farmer training and joint training. We don't see an improvement when we only train the intermediaries. Um, however, the knowledge different, improvement in knowledge wasn't significantly different between the two groups. Um, with intermediary knowledge, we do see an improvement in their knowledge, suggesting that they weren't just uh, sitting in, in the room, but they were also uh, listening to the, the, the training materials. Um, so there is an improvement in intermediate knowledge there. However, um, if we look at whether these knowledge measures predict product quality, only farmer knowledge is a significant predictor, but intermediate knowledge doesn't seem to have any relationship with uh, our measures of product quality. Also, farmer awareness didn't seem to have improved from the training program, suggesting that probably uh, even before the training, farmers were somewhat aware of, of, of pesticide use and food safety. Once we control for farmer knowledge, we find that uh, the magnitude of the coefficients on farmer training and during training reduces by about 20 to uh, 30%. 
So moving on to the next mechanism, uh, this graph shows uh, the type of trade patterns we see uh, from the reported by the farmer. So in the top left figure, we see uh, the, a gradual increase among the, the joint training group in terms of contract trade within the cluster. So this is a contract trade with uh, the buyers who participated in the training program. Uh, on, the, on the top right panel, we don't see uh, an increase in contract trade with buyers who are outside this training program. Um, on the bottom left figure, we see an e also see an increase in spot trade with, between the participating farmers and exporting intermediaries, um, suggesting that um, the buyer participation did facilitate trade between uh, farmers and exporting intermediaries. And in particular, it also led to an increase in use of, of informal uh, in contract trade. So in this context, most of the contracts are based on informal agreements rather than a formal written contract. Okay, so, um, so what does that mean in terms of uh, turning knowledge into action? So if you look at the relationship between farm gate price and product quality, so in columns one and three, it suggests that uh, farmers in joint training received a higher return to improvement in product quality of, in farm gate price. But if we interact joint training with trade within clusters, so these are tra farmers trading with directly with these participating buyers, we see that that captures the most of the, the returns from increasing quality. So column four, the coefficient on column four on the triple interaction term suggests that uh, most of the gains in, uh, in price returns quality are coming from farmers who were also trained together with these uh, with participating buyers and directly trading between the two. Um, however, if we look at um, uh, observable quality, we don't necessarily see a higher price return uh, from trading directly within the cluster, suggesting that trade within cluster is characterized by uh, improvement in asymmetric information, also mitigating uh, distrust, and uh, therefore the, the, the export intermediaries are providing a higher uh, price to these farmers. So. Um, this uh, graph shows that uh, shows difference between uh, trades that were based on contracts and, and just spot trade. So uh, studies suggest that contract trading can improve product quality. So here, uh, the, the top two panels show uh, use gap compliance and pesticide residue as a measure of quality. And we basically find that uh, contract trades are likely to be on the uh, top right uh, quadrant. So uh, these are associated with higher prices and higher quality. Um, and the result is consistent if you use pesticide residue. However, if you use observable quality index instead of uh, a food safety measure, uh, we don't necessarily see that association between price and quality, suggesting that most of these contracts were based on food safety or, or, or compliance with regulations rather than something that was that's uh, observable or verifiable by the, the buyers. So uh, to conclude, uh, the, the two main findings are first, uh, we find that training farmers do improve product quality, but the effects can be much larger when downstream buyers also participate in the training program. Uh, we think that the key mechanism here is that buyer participation helps mitigate distrust, uh, which can foster contract trading and incentivizes farmers to actually uh, upgrade quality. Um, in terms of policy implication, I, uh, we believe that our results suggest that technology training can be effective in improving quality, but uh, relaxing demand side constraints such as distrust and asymmetric information can be important for incentivizing uh, farmers and, and producers to actually take, turn knowledge into action. Um, it, our study has several limitations. Uh, we focus on short and midterm impacts. Uh, therefore, uh, long-term impacts might also depend on reputation and learning. Um, the institutional environment and our results might also depend on the market structure or institutional environment. Um, we have two pieces of ongoing work. Uh, so um, certification might be another way to alleviate uh, distrust. So we have an another RCT going on to evaluate the impact of certification on quality upgrading. Uh, another piece of work looks at the interaction of trade and domestic policies on agricultural quality upgrading. So that's going to combine our experimental data with the structural IO methodology. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sang Yong. So now we will move to the last presentation, uh, Wendy Wong, presenting optimal monitoring and bureaucrat adjustments. So this paper um, is about a monitoring policy of bureaucrats who are responsible for implementing India's public employment program. And today we'll be thinking about the design of monitoring policies when we have a choice but that, that aims to maximize deterrence of bureaucrat misconduct when we have a choice of the information communicated to them about their audit risk. 
So the main research question of this paper is, if we're interested in maximizing deterrence um, through the communication of audit risks while keeping the budget and the rules of the audit fixed, then should we inform bureaucrats of their audit in advance or audit them unexpectedly? And I'll be focusing in this paper on the financial misappropriation of bureaucrats implementing India's public employment program. What I find is that it's actually better in this particular setting to inform bureaucrats of their audit. This, uh, the question that this paper asks and the main finding is compelling because the prevailing logic in published auditing standards, for example, is that maintaining uncertainty among your audit subjects is best practice, where the concern is that if your audit subjects otherwise had information about their audit in advance and they'd strategically adjust their behavior potentially in order to evade detection. But in theory, if we're interested in maximizing deterrence, then this may not always be the best approach. For a bit of intuition on why that might be the case, Suppose that you have an audit agency or principal who only has a, a, a capacity to audit a small share of uh, bureaucrats, M over N total bureaucrats, and bureaucrats know this. The principal has a choice over the information communicated to them about their audit risk. And this information is going to influence the distribution of bureaucrats' posterior probabilities of audit or their expectations of being audited. And so what we're going to be interested in is how do bureaucrats deterrence measured in changes in misappropriated expenditures change as their expectations of being audited change? And we're interested in this because it's going to help us determine what the optimal signal is in this particular setting. So to illustrate, suppose that you have bureaucrats that tend to over respond in their deterrence to lower probabilities of an audit as um, represented by this concave U of Q that you see here then a policy that leaves bureaucrats with their prior expectations of, uh, of a low probability of an audit would, be, would actually be a pretty effective deterrent. But, um, and and that, would be, that would lead to more deterrence in aggregate than a policy that provided more information to bureaucrats about their audit risk, concentrating bureaucrats' expectations at the endpoints here, um, denoted by, by the square. Now suppose instead that you have uh, bureaucrats who tend to under respond in their deterrence to lower probabilities of an audit. Then a policy that left bureaucrats with their prior expectations of a low probability of an audit would lead to low levels of deterrence. And the principal could instead consider a policy where more information is provided by informing those who are actually selected for audit that they're high risk and those who are not selected that they're low risk and be able to achieve more deterrence in aggregate than a policy that provided no additional information at all. Where, so in this case, the informative signal is optimal. So what matters for determining the optimal signal is the shape of the relationship between bureaucrats' deterrence and their expectations of being audited, or the shape of U of Q, especially if that U of Q is nonlinear. And so the question is, what is U of Q in, in this empirical setting? So in the setting that I study, the state of Jharkhand in the eastern part of India, the state randomly allocated audits in a way that led to varying expectations among bureaucrats about their likelihood of being audited. And I'm going to leverage this variation to address the proposed question on how to optimally communicate audit risk. And I'll do so through the two main components of this paper. In the first component, I'm going to estimate the effect of these, of these uh, expectations on a proxy for misappropriated expenditures. So essentially what we're learning here is how do bureaucrats strategically respond as their expectations of being audited change. Then um, given what we've learned about their strategic response, what should the principal communicate to them about their audit risk? And here I apply a model of information design to help um, characterize the optimal signal in this setting. And what we learn from um, this model, which follows the literature on Bayesian persuasion, is that knowing how bureaucrats respond in their deterrence as your expectations change is sufficient. And by sufficient, I mean that it's enough information for us to be able to characterize the optimal signal, but also compare welfare under the optimal signal to alternative signals. And you can think of welfare from the perspective of the principal, in this case, measured in uh, levels of deterrence. So as I'm sure many of you are familiar, India's um, public employment pr program guarantees households in rural areas um, employment to provide manual labor um, to, uh, on, on public projects. In the state of Jharkhand, 
over um, 7 million people have participated in the program and over a million projects have been worked on since uh, this, the inception of the program in the state in 2006. Um, but corruption remains problematic in, in, in this program and it's been well documented in, in the media, academic and, and government literatures. The Gram Panchayat, or I'll, which I'll refer to as the GP, is the lowest administrative unit that's responsible for implementing this program. And this is the unit that was audited. Now in the state of Jharkhand, what they did was they had GPs take turns being audited so that GPs could all be audited regularly. And um, the way that that was implemented was that GPs were randomly selected without replacement each year. And so what happened um, in this setting is that the round of first audits were rolled out over the span of three years from 2016 to 19, which is the study period of this paper. And during this period, over 4,000 GPs received an audit. So what happens within the audit year is that at the beginning of the year, an announcement is released by the audit agency and everyone learns who's being audited and when that audit's happening within the year. And they also learn that work in the previous fiscal year is subject to evaluation by the auditors. Then in due course, the auditors arrive throughout the year and they're looking to reconcile administrative reports on labor and material expenditures as well as project uh, details by interviewing households, matching receipts and visiting uh, project work sites. And um, one thing that's important to note is that what's also subject to evaluation is ongoing work at the, at the GP, because when the auditors uh, interview households, they're also soliciting complaints from the households with, um, with any uh, issues that they're experiencing, uh, ongoing issues that they're experiencing with the, with the program. So um, in this slide, I'm gonna describe what the audit rollout looked like over the three years and how the information environment is changing uh, for the bureaucrats who are anticipating uh, their audit. And the relevant question to have in mind is, what is the likelihood that my work this year will, or today will be audited in the following year because it's the last fiscal year's work that gets audited. And that's going to be a share of the number of GPs selected for audit next year as a share of the number of GPs remaining to be audited because we have this randomization without replacement that's happening. And um, most of this information can, can be uh, inferred from, uh, from the announcements, except for next year's audit capacity, which I'll talk a little bit uh, more about in a bit. So what happens is year one is announced and 550 GPs are selected for audit. The remaining GPs are left anticipating when their first audit is going to happen. Year two is announced and we have 1500 GPs selected for audit. The re remaining GPs are still left anticipating when their audit is happening or is going to happen reasonably with higher expectation than in year one because now there are fewer GPs left in the pool to be selected. At the same time, we have that those who were just select, uh, audited in year one uh, the wave one GPs are now left anticipating when their next audit is going to happen. And they can reasonably expect to not receive their second audit until the ongoing round of audits is completed for their peers. Then year three is announced, about 2,100 GPs are selected for audit. And this happens to be the remaining number of GPs um, for the first round. Waves one and two, are anticipating when their next audit is happening. They observe that this ongoing round of audits is, is completing and can reasonably expect with high expectation that, um, that they'll be selected for their second round of audits in the following year. So um, one thing to note- Excuse me, Wendy, we have a clarification question since you're on the author, it's best if you answer. Sure. Uh, so the question is from Rajesh Ramachandran. Are we thinking of capture by village elites or are we thinking about capture by bureaucrats who are supposed to release resources and do not reach the village to start with? Yes, so my measurement, my unit of measurement is going to be what's happening at the GP level, which is going to capture a collection of bureaucrats um, made up of an elected official and appointed officials who are responsible for, for implementing this program. So in this paper, I won't be able to disentangle where the capture is happening. Thank you for, for the question. Um, so one thing important to point out is that year over year, the audit capacity is changing and that's going to affect bureaucrats' uh, expectations. Um, as I mentioned, next year's audit capacity is not observed. So um, 
in, in, um, in the paper and um, in later results, I'm going to have to make an assumption on how bureaucrats are formulating their beliefs about next year's audit capacity to pin down precise probabilities. But for now, um, I want to remain agnostic to that and just estimate what's happening in, um, in, in, in how bureaucrats are responding during the horizons of anticipation that are captured by the dotted and, and uh, the dotted and dashed lines. And so I want to know what's happening when bureaucrats are anticipating their audit in year one and year two, and when they're anticipating their audit in years two and three. And for ease of interpretation of the regressions that I'm going to show you, I'm going to relabel these groups as uh, low, medium, zero, and high probability groups. Um, and another uh, thing to note is that I'm going to consider the month in which the audit happens as the probability um, one group for precisely because ongoing work is subject to evaluation. Um, but the, the results later that I show um, are robust to exclusion of, of, of what's happening here. Okay, so to estimate the causal effect of these varying expectations, I'm going to employ an event study specification um, well, it is Wendy. One more yes. clarification question from Michael Alavisti. How long do the audits last? Yeah, so auditors are, are present um, um, for a week at the GP conducting the audits, and the audits usually end with um, um, a public forum where the reports are shared, but then any follow up, any, any unresolved issues um, get escalated to higher levels. So potentially the audit process could drag on. Um, so I'm going to use the event study to um, um, employ an event study specification, which will allow me to estimate behavior during these horizons of anticipation that we saw in the previous figure. And so I'm going to construct treatment variables using uh, the dates that these announcements are released by the audit agency to construct events in the panel data. And so these events are going to serve as markers for when bureaucrats' expectations are changing because they just received updated information from the announcements. And, um, and outcome variables will be constructed with administrative data um, using monthly program expenditures, which I'll be able to disaggregate into wage and material expenditures. So program expenditures, of course, comprise both uh, what I'll call honest and misappropriated expenditures. Um, but I'll, what I'll be doing here is using the estimated changes in program expenditures as a proxy for the estimated changes in misappropriated expenditures that are driven by differences in bureaucrats' expectations of being audited, which, as we um, saw, arise from the randomization without replacement. Um, is there another? Uh, okay, I'll continue. So, um, is there another question? Or okay, it's okay. I'm only taking okay. clarify, clarifying okay. questions. This one we leave it for later. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So in the paper, um, the results from additional tests uh, support that using program expenditures is a reasonable proxy for misappropriated expenditures in this particular setting. Um, and for the, in the interest of time, I'm also going to leave details on the, identif the identification, further details on the identification strategy and tests of the identifying assumptions in the paper, but I'm also happy to answer um, more questions about that if you'd like to know. Um, okay, so this will allow us to jump straight into the, the main results. So here I'm showing you um, estimates from the event study of how bureaucrats are behaving during the horizons of anticipation, which I've relabeled into, into the zero, low, medium, high, and probability one groups. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the, the outcome measure uh, expenditures, but in reverse y scale so that we can interpret declines in expenditures as increases in deterrence. And here, the low probability group is the reference group. So the first thing to observe is that bureaucrats tend to under-respond when their expectations are lower. Particularly when their expectations are zero to medium probability, their response is statistically indistinguishable from one another. And then when their expectations are high to certain, they're much more responsive on, on the margin where I estimate a 15% decline in expenditures. Now, if we disaggregate these results into wage and material expenditures, we see that there's an average decline in wage expenditures, though not statistically significant, and an increase, uh, but, it, but it's coupled with an increase in material expenditures, which is statistically significant for the medium probability group. 
And um, additional results in the paper using audit report data supports that what's happening here is that bureaucrats are substituting wage for material misappropriation when their expectations are lower. Now, when expectations are, are high to certain, we, we observe declines in both wage and material expenditures where these results um, are being driven by, um, by a decline in wage expenditures. So altogether, um, we see that there's, um, that bureaucrats tend to under respond um, in their deterrence when their expectations are lower and they're much more responsive when their expectations are high. Um, and that there's evidence of substitution across expenditure types. So given what we've learned about how bureaucrats strategically respond, what should the principal communicate to bureaucrats about their audit risk? And um, as I mentioned earlier, I apply a model of information design to help determine the optimal signal in this setting, um, where, the, uh, where we have a principal that has a choice over the, uh, over the information communicated to bureaucrats. Bureaucrats observe this information and act accordingly um, when they make a decision on how much to misappropriate. And um, what we learned from the model is that knowing how bureaucrats strategically respond as their expectations change, or the U of Q that we saw in the introductory example, is sufficient for us to be able to characterize the optimal signal in the setting and also analyze welfare, um, comparing the optimal signal to alternative signals. And um, we'll, I'll be able to estimate U of Q using the causally identified empirical moments that we just saw in the results for, uh, on total expenditures. Now, going from those results to estimating U of Q requires a, a set of assumptions, one of which allows us to, um, to map bureaucrats, zero, low, medium, high, and certain expectations of being audited to precise probabilities. So here's an example of what the estimated U of Q looks like under a particular assumption that I've made about how bureaucrats are formulating their beliefs about next year's audit capacity, which allows us to pin down um, the, the uh, precise probabilities on, on their beliefs. And so what we see here is that the estimated U of Q is convex, um, um, that bureaucrats tend to under respond when, they're, when their expectations are lower and they're much more responsive when their expectations are high. And what this means is that informing a policy which informs bureaucrats perfectly about whether they're going to be audited or not would lead to higher levels of deterrence than a policy that left bureaucrats with their prior expectations of being audited, where I assume the prior in this uh, particular example to be the maximum of, of the observed capacity over this period. And this result is also um, holds under a flexible set of assumptions that I make about how bureaucrats are formulating their expectations. Um, I also, um, this, the, the conclusion is also robust to a series of checks, relaxing the assumptions. Uh, the other main assumption that's being made, which is that the differences in estimated behavior from these horizons, uh, between these horizons of anticipation are only explained by differences in, in expectations. So what this leaves us with is that the principal would prefer the full information signal over a signal where some information is provided and that's preferred to a signal where no information no additional information is provided at all, where I've designed the sum information signal to be equivalent to randomization without replacement in this setting, and the no information signal to be equivalent to randomization with replacement. The full information signal would have led to $35 million less in misappropriated expenditures compared to a signal where no information was provided at all over the course of these three periods. And that's equivalent to about 16% of the state's annual expenditures. So to conclude, um, this paper contributes to two strands of literature. The first focuses on the effectiveness of monitoring, where there's ample empirical evidence on how the rules of monitoring can be designed to be more effective. But little is known about um, strategic responses to monitoring policies and how it may lead to unintended consequences. Um, and even less is known about what these strategic responses imply for designing monitoring policies that aim to maximize deterrence. So this paper contributes to this literature by estimating and showing how bureaucrats strategically adjust. And um, they do so by leveraging the rich variation in bureaucrats' expectations along with detailed and disaggregated data uh, about uh, on program expenditures. And in mapping the, uh, the estimates of the bureaucrats' response to a model of information design, 
Um, this paper shows how information disseminated on audit risk can be optimally designed in an empirical setting. Um, this paper also provides empirical evidence on the value of information design, where it complements a theoretical body of work in this area. Um, um, and I'm able to, so what I do is I apply this theory to estimate, um, to, to determine what the optimal signal is in an empirical setting, and I'm able to do so using causally identified empirical moments in the, in the data. And these results, along with the analysis of counterfactuals, provide a novel empirical estimate of the, of the value of information in this setting. It makes a strong case for evaluating the gains to the design of information in other empirical settings. Um, and I will stop there. Feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to discuss further. And sorry, I couldn't handle all the questions, but I'm happy to. Oh, no worry. It. That's, uh, that's something <laughs> that is for the end. Thank you so much, Wendy. So maybe now we can start with some of the answer questions that were for you, since you have no concerts here for this paper. So Debrach, do you want to uh, ask your question that is in the chat? Yeah, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mika? Yes. Wendy. Yes. Hi, yes. Wendy. Uh, I really found this a very interesting paper. The, the only uh, question that I have is that I'm really worried that there's no replacement policy. I mean, you know, knowing the Indian government, there's no telling, right? Any moment they might just switch back to saying, okay, now we are just going to again sample again from the entire pool of panchayats, right? Mm -hmm. And in that case, the GPs at the low end would be unsure whether they might get audited again. They might hedge their bets. Mm -hmm. And they would comply even though the audit has just passed them by, right? And they, they, you know, they might get audited. That would that would bias your estimation towards convexity of the U function because mm -hmm. they're taking their bets near the bottom. Yeah. So, and then so the the concern is like what they actually what their beliefs actually are, even though they're being provided these exactly. announcements. If they would really, really believe that they would not be audited. Yeah. They would yeah. Be complying at the low end. I don't know. Yeah. And, and that's something that I was concerned about too. Um, and I um, I attempted to um, do some work uh, um, surveying the bureaucrats about what their beliefs are about how these audits were Im being implemented. And um, I'm still in the middle of um, finishing that up and, and processing the results. But one, um, reassuringly, one of the most common responses that I see is that they think there's this turn taking that's happening. So they don't know that there's randomization without replacement going on, but, um, but that there is, um, that they're aware that, and, and for some, some of them, that there is turn taking that's happening. Thanks for your question. In fact, now we, we have also a question from Rachel. I don't know if you want to, to ask it with the camera. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, uh, hi, Wendy. Uh, super interesting hi. talk. You know, I was just a bit confused about, you know, what are the various layers which are working here, you know? So, uh, you know, you often refer to the village panchayat as being the bureaucrat, you know? And yeah. if you think about the actual structure that's at work here, you know, there are the bureaucrats, as we think about it in the Indian system, as being yes. the IAS officers or, you know, the civil of servants, course. you know, yeah. not the elected representatives, you know. And, you know, so at some level, you know, they are responsible for releasing funds. They also have a pie at stake, you know. So I was just confused that, you know, who comes to audit, you know, is it the bureaucrat themselves who's going to come to audit, who themselves have a stake in the pie in terms of, you know, cuts that they could get. And when, if you allow for that, you know, then isn't the unit at which the corruption happening become very important for the way we think about the problem? You know, is it that the funds are reaching the village panchayat and then they are getting distorted away? And so the bureaucrats in some sense in the clean and then I can see that bureaucrat functioning and audit performance, or is it the case that, you know, the funds never reach the village because the bureaucrat keeps them uh, for themselves. And then in that sense, you know, who's auditing whom I was, kind yes. of a bit confused about these, yes. you know, the layer of operations mm -hmm. because, yeah, thanks so much. Yes, uh, thank you for your question. I think this um, relates to one of the, the earlier questions, which is that, well, what I'm able to measure in terms of how expenditures are changing is is at the, the GP level. And um, and so the, the responses, the, e the elasticity and the responses that we're observing as, as what I'm calling bureaucrats, co collection of, of the GP level bureaucrats, as their expectations are changing is, is for what's happening uh, uh, for these collection of bureaucrats at the GP level. So it's, it's the state level 
uh, audit agency that's coming in to audit what's happening um, at the GP level. Um, um, if that if that answers your question, so usually it's a, it's, a, it's a, the GP level bureaucrats that are that are present for the audits and um, responsible for answering to issues that are documented by auditors. Great, thank you. So Nishit, you have another question uh, for Wendy. Do you want to ask? Okay, I, can, I have it here. So what he's asking if this coincide with monitoring done by the center? Um, to my knowledge, I, I haven't seen that, uh, haven't seen it coincide from, so like, I think uh, monitoring done by the center will sometimes focus on the higher tiers of, of implementation, um, but, um, but it's something that I, I, can, I can double check. I'm not 100% sure on that. Then the next question we have from uh, Alessandro Tarossi is, do you have any information on who gets the money? In example, do you see more targeting towards own group? Um, I do. So I have tried to look at that a little bit, um, breaking down the results by whether um, whether the elected official is um, is face favoring household to um, who I've categorized as, as their own group or not. And I don't see um, many differences uh, uh, in the results at the moment. Thanks. Perfect. And then the last question that we had in the chat for you was, there seems to be an assumption that all effects of audits are anticipatory. Can you talk about the implications of this for identification, whether this seems reasonable? This is from Sina yeah. Shanef. Yes. Um, so one of the concerns that I, that I have about um, interpreting these estimates as purely as changes and differences in their expectations is that it could be that the audit quality is changing over time or bureaucrats are learning to respond to the audit quality different, which, which may confound um, 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 what I'm saying are differences in expectations. So I, I do a couple of checks um, and I find that um, at least using data on audit inputs that there are no um, so like detectable differences across the years of, of, of audits that I have data on. Um, but I also break down the responses um, by, so, so like uh, I also try to break down the responses across the waves in which, um, uh, ac across the, the, the waves in which like GP got audited and, and for say the anticipation group in, in year three, for example, which is the high probability group, if I break down their, um, their responses, they're, they're not statistically distinguishable. So I find that they're responding similarly, even though they received their audit in different years in the past. Thank you so much, Wendy. So now let's open the floor for questions for all the papers. So what you can do is to use the option of raising hand and, I can, and then I can mention the first one that we have. So let's see if we have any questions. I'm also trying like to learn how this works, but it seems. Let's give it a couple of minutes. And if not, I go to the list of unanswered questions from the other speakers. Okay, I will go through here. Okay, there was only one question, but I think you answer for Sayon from CIMA. It says, did the training material increase intermediaries' ability to assess high quality or farmers' ability to produce high quality dragon fruit? All right, so uh, we think that training did improve farmers' knowledge and probably also the, the intermediaries' capability for uh, say, uh, uh, monitoring or like uh, assessing the, the quality of products. For example, they could have visited the farms and tried to assess like whether they're actually complying or not. Um, so uh, what we do is we actually uh, look at whether these intermediary knowledge, so the gain in their knowledge is a uh, predictor of the, the quality uh, provided by the farmer in order to try to see uh, what, what's the mechanism behind, for example, joint training, uh, where uh, buyers are also participating in training program. Um, so we don't find that relationship between uh, the, the improvement in farmer knowledge also leading to an increase in farmer quality. So um, yeah, so at least we think that the reason why um, we see a larger effect in, in joint training is not necessarily because like farm intermediaries can now better monitor the, the quality of the product, 
but uh, through other other reasons. Okay, it seems that we don't have a question except Martin. Do you have a question for the first presenters? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so one thing that we, we liked about seeing you and Erica's papers is that they have this sort of like common structure and extremely different settings with extremely different interventions. And so I wanted to ask kind of broadly if you had thoughts about like in these kind of vertical relationships where you study where you think information and incentive complementarities are likely to be important and not solved potentially through like market mechanisms. So I think I missed, was this a question for me? Because I got confused. Yes, it was for you and Sangyal. <laughs> okay, so I didn't follow the question. So maybe Gianmarco, who is who I see online, or Stefano can answer. Sorry. No, I, I think that he, here it's basically the contracting failures that, that allow complementarities to kick in uh, and, and to, to, get, to get all the traction um, from the complementarities. And, and for when we talk about uh, contracting failures in, in this setting, uh, basically we have a, a, an, an information asymmetry um, where where the, um, the the supervisor is not able to perfectly observe um, the the output, right, uh, and, and therefore cannot establish uh, proper contracts with the uh, um, with the workers. Um, so should I, um, are, are you done? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so I, I think in, 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 in terms of our context of the supply chain, um, and in particular, because we look at, uh, quality food, food safety, which is a quality that might be, that introduces asymmetric information, um, between the, the producer and also downstream buyers. Um, although, um, our focus is going to be here and not, uh, we just take the asymmetric information between say the final consumer and, and the retailer as given. Um, so here uh, the incentive problem is basically, um, can the buyer provide uh, enough price incentive for farmers to actually comply and how are buyers going to uh, trust that um, like if monitoring is costly, how are they going to actually um, trust the quality that is provided by the farmer? So, so in our case, uh, we incorporate this buyer participation in the training program. So it's allowing farmers and intermediaries to interact, um, uh, which might help mitigate uh, distrust, but also um, it, it, it also alleviates the, the distrust from the farmer's point of view of whether you know, this export intermediary is really serious about uh, uh, purchasing a high quality product. So uh, we, we think that that is also another incentive that, that works uh, in this context. Okay, do you have any other questions? Like if anyone has, like you can just unmute yourself. And yeah, ask. Uh, Maria, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand, but I liked Martin's <laughs> comment and one juxtaposition that I had in my mind between the two projects was the fact that, you know, with the supervisor or worker, those are kind of pre-made matches that are quite sticky. Well, in the context of the dragon fruit market uh, markets, these are kind of almost market matches where I think uh, a detail of the design that wasn't clear to me, but I had a side conversation with uh, Hong Song about that clarified it was exactly the, the, the details of the, um, the experimental design with respect to how these matches were made across all different treatment groups and, and how the randomization occurred. And then also clarifying on the stickiness of the matches in the baseline market versus the stickiness post intervention. And I thought it might be worth bringing that to the larger group, maybe Song Yoon or Hong Sung could clarify that and maybe speak a little bit about how that might also relate back to Martin's point. So Hong Sung, do you want to uh, answer? I think it's okay. You can, I think you can answer, so it's okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, um, I, I, I didn't uh, look at what Hong Sung actually replied, but um, so, um, so the, the way we, we actually uh, conducted the experiment was in, in the supply chain, there are actually, th um, so there are two types of intermediaries. One is a local collector as a middleman, and then we have the export intermediaries 
who are going to who usually purchase the products from these local collectors. So in fact, what our experiment is doing is we're uh, somewhat cutting off the middleman in the supply chain and directly connecting the farmer and the export intermediary. Uh, one rationale for us to do that was uh, export intermediaries are most keen on on on, on uh, the, the the quality of the fruit because they're contracted with overseas buyers and it's 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 their responsibility to actually uh, provide that type of quality. Whereas local collectors are more small scale and seems to be uh, capacity constrained and, and uh, less of less interested in. Uh, in terms of, of, of high quality fruits. So that was one motivation for us to uh, work directly with farmers and export intermediaries. It's true. So if you look at the baseline survey, uh, um, like farmers and local, most of the trade happens between the farmers and local collectors. Um, they have about four years of uh, experience on average of trading with each other. So this relationship is, is sticky. Uh, that might be one reason why we don't see uh, even a higher share of trade occurring directly between the farmers and export intermediaries. Um, and also in the past, uh, why we might have not been observing a lot of trade between these two parties. Um, so in any case, we think that uh, there is a value of this relationship between the farmer and the local collector, which was pre-existing. And uh, in order to uh, somewhat uh, change the pattern, change the relationship from a farmer to local collector to a farmer to expert intermediary, uh, would would definitely require a, a higher returns, uh, prior price returns to quality, um, and incentivizing farmers to actually uh, to take that uh, action in order to uh, or upgrade their quality to uh, sell to another buyer. Okay, I think that we are right now running out of time for this first session, so. Uh, we will meet in one hour for the next session, so this is the break. Thank you everyone for presenting. These were great papers and super interesting. I wish we could use the clapping hands here, but they were great. Okay, see you everyone in one hour. Uh, in between children uh, in in different uh, regions and areas within the same countries that may, are ascribed usually as a difference in student preparation before they enter into school, uh, teacher uh, uh, labor supply or in general incentives to be in school and parental support uh, among others. <clears throat> so we tackle this issue in a multifaceted program and interventions uh, in in a very uh, poor and marginalized context in, in rural Mexico. So the, the intervention uh, is actually uh, uh, akin to other interventions that, that are implemented in different countries, including in, in, in developed countries, is an intervention whereby the government uh, uh, recruits uh, university graduates, young professionals, and uh, uh, deploy them as mobile tutors or mentors in these very highly marginalized uh, communities. These mentors do basically three things. They provide pedagogical support to the local teachers. They uh, uh, do one-on-one -on -one tutoring and remedial sessions to, to students lagging behind and they uh, visit parents and, and do home visits to try and engage them toward uh, their children education. Um, so what do we do in this paper? Uh, there's uh, basically, we, we run in RCTs uh, and this is kind of a standard RCT, except that there is no JPAL, uh, but is really the government uh, implementing the RCT in the context of their, its own resources, uh, logistics and budget. And, and that's important for the thing that I'm gonna be discussing. And in particular, we're gonna randomize different uh, training modalities for these mobile mentors. And uh, through this randomization design and a, a very detailed data collection, we will try to unpack the channels through which mentors affect uh, children's uh, achievements and, and schooling attainments. And then in the second part of the paper, uh, we will use the fact that that same intervention, again, implemented and evaluated in the government uh, was scaled up by the same government agency that was uh, uh, partnering up with us in the evaluation. And so we have the kind of natural experiment of having the same set of communities that are followed through in the experimental small scale setting and then in the subsequent national rollout. And this will allow us to shed some light on the challenges and mechanism of scalability in this specific context, as well as provide additional results of, of, of program exposure in the medium run. Um, <clears throat> so we have three sets of results. Uh, given the short time of this presentation, let me uh, preview them to you in case I don't get to 
to, to, to cover all of them. Uh, so the, the, the first important results based on the RCT evidence is that training matters. We, have, we find no effects, no statistical effect of the standard training modality, um, which is actually based on a, on a, on a, on a module that was already uh, used by the government in a pre-existing version of the program. And we find instead very sizable effect on this uh, uh, plus or enhanced training modality on a variety of student outcomes. Uh, the second important result is, is relates to the channels through which these mentors affects uh, uh, student outcomes. And we find uh, direct evidence that there's basically a very strong complementarity between mentors with enhanced training and parental uh, support and investments, uh, whereas we don't find evidence that is supportive of other, other uh, complementary uh, channels. And uh, the third important results is that as it relates to the evidence at scale of the program, uh, where if we find that basically the program impact at scale, again, for the same set of communities are very much in line with the experimental estimates. Uh, and then this speaks to a sort of very uh, important literature now in development, sp speaking about the scalability of, of, of RCT interventions uh, across different contexts and within the same country, but on a sort of a large scale. Um, we also find that uh, th there's a sort of a program, important program exposure effects, which has very large magnitudes in terms of secondary school enrollments. And in particular, uh, the, the magnitudes allow to entirely close the gap between urban and rural uh, kids in terms of transition to secondary. Uh, we also find that schools after the experiment are more likely to remain open. This is, in a sense, a challenge because it induces differential attrition for long-term outcomes, but in our sense, it's also a mechanism through which the program sort of uh, is enhancing its scalability. Um, and we sort of support the evidence of schools remaining open in the medium run through the same mechanism by which mentors affects uh, outcomes in the short run, again, through this involvement of parents and in general community involvement uh, that uh, maintain school opens through, through the presence of the mentors. Um, quick on the context. So the, this, uh, uh, in Mexico, there is this semi-autonomous branch of the education ministry that uh, provides full-fledged services to these very remote, mainly indigenous communities in Mexico across a variety of states. Uh, we're gonna focus on Chiapas in the context of our evaluation, but CONAF is present throughout the, the, the territory in Mexico. Uh, it's, it covers a fair amount of schools, 10% of all the entire public schools in Mexico are part of this uh, CONAFE uh, institution, and uh, uh, very large section, parts of students and teachers as well. So how does this work? It's, it's based on a sort of community-based model, which it's common in other countries as well. So the schools are multi-grade, that's an important part of the uh, context. Uh, they're very small, so all students are in the same class, in spite of being in different grades, sometimes they get organized in different activities by grade, but most all of them are in the same space. Uh, they are very much lagging behind with respect to the national average. Here are a few stats from our sample. Our country group is between 0 0.5 and 0 0.7 standard deviation below national average, national average is standardized test. And in terms of transition to secondary, which is almost universal for the uh, national average is 95%. Here we have less than two thirds of kids that get into secondary. So there's a huge dropout rate between primary and secondary in these communities. Um, the teachers are, community instructors that usually come from the uh, community. They're very young uh, with secondary education, no formal training. They're not sort of uh, trained or official teachers. They're hired by CONAFE on a temporary basis on very short-term contracts with very low salary in very difficult conditions. There's a huge turnover of these of this, uh, uh, teachers in these areas. One quarter quit before completing the first year. Their incentives to be in the part of this program is that they get a scholarship to then go on to college or higher education. And this is actually important for some of the things that I will be discussing later. Uh, and then the third component of this community-based program is parents that basically through a parental association, they oversee the overall functioning of the school and they actually have a say in, in different aspects of both the pedagogical and curriculum part of the program, but also for example, to decide whether to keep the school open or not. So um, in this very challenging context, uh, the CONAFE launched this um, mobile pro uh, pedagogical mentors 
API for this uh, Spanish acronym. Um, it, it was launched uh, in 2009. And uh, uh, as I said, this idea of hiring and recruiting uh, recent university graduates on a two-year contracts, these uh, uh, are assigned to a pair of um, communities and they provide these three uh, services. As I said before, one-on-one -on -one tutoring for most of their time. And then they devote the other 40% of their time allocation in this community to either home visits to parents to engage them and, and, and inform them about their kids and their kids' education and pedagogical support to instructors in terms of um, helping and training the local instructor to be more effective in the pedagogical practices. So this original intervention was evaluated previously, not by us, uh, through both qualitative and quantitative approaches. And uh, there are several implementation flows were highlighted in this original evaluation, including the fact that most of these mentors did not speak this, the indigenous language of the community. And this was, of of course, a problem. Uh, there was probably not full compliance with duties and in particular to the home visits. And they were, uh, they were claiming at least these mobile mentors that they were insufficiently trained. Here comes our evaluation. That is a standard stratified randomization uh, in, uh, in a bunch of school, 230 schools, as I said, in, in Chiapas. This is a random subset of all the CONAFE schools in Chiapas. They didn't get the intervention uh, at the moment of the evaluation, which was 2014. Uh, these are divided in three groups. The country groups is status quo. Then there's a, a, what we call an API standard group where basically we follow the, uh, the previous uh, approach with only one week of training for the mentors. And then there's a few additional requirements, uh, including the fact that these mentors need to speak the indigenous language uh, to become eligible. <clears throat> and then uh, some other incentives for their supervisor to actually monitor their activities and make sure they actually comply with their duties. And then there's the API plus group, which is consistent of this enhanced training model that consists of an extra week of training focused on teaching the basics of both math and Spanish. There was a specific uh, module designed for this additional training. And it consists of other bi-monthly, so every two months peer-to-peer uh, -peer sessions among the mentors uh, where basically they exchange their, their, their experiences and they stay for two, three days in the same place and try to sort of help each other out in, in dealing with the difficulties that their job entail. Um, so um, we have a bunch of data. There is a, we, we don't have a, the, the baseline data is purely admin uh, on both schools and students. Uh, uh, it's the randomization worked both in terms of this admin data and other survey data that we have um, sort of predetermined in terms of information. Uh, and, uh, and these are in the paper. Um, we have a first follow up where basically we detect two years of exposure, experimental exposure to the API program. And we have a bunch of outcomes, including a detailed assessment of cognitive achievements. Uh, these were probably some of you may be aware of this. EGRA and EGMA tests that are implemented in a variety of different countries. Uh, those are usually meant for kids about in the first or second grade. Here we implement them for third and six, from three to six graders, just as I said, because those kids are very much lagging behind. And then we have a full model of uh, social emotional index, so social emotional question that sort of we aggregate through an index. We have administrative data on transitions and a lot of questions on parents, parent mentor interaction, mentor survey. And also, and also detailed classroom observations to uh, understand the pedagogical practices of the local teachers. Then there has been a second follow-up, which actually was during the national rollout of the program, where we had some admin data and some additional round of survey data that we collected. So <clears throat> um, if there are no uh, questions, uh, I just go on. Yes. Uh, interrupt me, feel free in case I, something is not clear, please. Um, so these are the main experimental impacts. Uh, you see here, uh, these are two years after the program. Those are the uh, reading and math achievement scores. And then the third column is the social emotional index based on these 32 uh, questions uh, asked to the caregiver, 
primary caregiver, and then the fourth column is this uh, administrative uh, transition to secondary four, six graders. And you see that uh, outcomes are uh, very much significant and much larger in the case of this API plus treatment, and they are much noisier and much smaller in magnitude and not statistically different from zero for, for the API plus. In the case of these two cognitive achievement measure, we can also reject that these two are equal at the 5% level. Um, Another important aspects of the intervention is not just the average effects, but the, how this sort of the distribution of these effects. And here we have some quantile regression that if in case you're interested, I can show it to you. But another way of, of looking at this is to show this basically empirical distribution of the class level standard deviation in these cognitive achievements, reading and math. And you see that the uh, API, uh, this plus intervention is basically decreasing the, uh, the standard deviation, uh, and um, whereas there is no statistical significant effect of the, of the standard intervention. So this is saying that, uh, and again, we have evidence on the quantile regression, that this uh, API program or these mentors is particularly effective for kids that are in the lower end of the distribution, and hence this overall distribution of cognitive ach achievement shrinks toward uh, around the mean. Um, so this is a little bit what I said. We have very strong differential impacts by training modality. The API plus effects are very large between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 standard deviation in the achievements and around 20% increase in transition to secondary schooling with respect to the mean in the country group. Um, we have also very large differential effects between standard and plus. These, the, uh, the standard, the plus, sorry, are three, four times larger than the standard on cognitive scores. As I said, significant, statistically significant from the two and uh, two times larger than the standard in terms of social emotional scores and attainments. Um, and as I said, uh, through quantile regressions and other sort of distributional treatment effects, we find mentors being particularly effective for lower achieving children. And this leads to more homogeneous classroom environment, roughly a 15% decrease in the class level standard deviation. Those are sort of the regression estimates of the uh, empirical distribution that I've shown you in the previous slides. So uh, the second question that one asks is why, what is going on? Why this API plus has been so much more effective and, uh, and uh, uh, amazing in driving these this, this magical outcomes. And so we, uh, um, uh, we tackle each specific component that the mentors uh, is, uh, or the duty that these mentors uh, do. So the uh, engagement with parents, the uh, instructors, and the uh, uh, remedial education sessions. So in this table, you'll see the first two columns is uh, parental outcomes. So the first column is um, a subjective expectations question about uh, the, uh, whether the parents expect their kids to complete secondary schooling. Um, and you see, again, very strong effects for API plus, very small and noisy effects for API standard. And again, you see that uh, uh, with respect to the mean in the control group is roughly a 20% increase in the uh, share of parents that expect their kids to uh, uh, finish successfully secondary education. And um, um, the second index is a parental investment index. It is an aggregate of five different questions about uh, time use or whether parents uh, help their kids to homework or with homework at, uh, in the afternoon, or whether they per actively participate in some of the school activities. And this is again, very uh, differential between plus and standard. And we can again, reject uh, then the two are equal. Um, the other two columns of this table in this panel A, it relates to uh, outcomes on the pedagogical uh, practices of the instructor. Uh, the first one is a standard sort of labor supply or monitoring effect that the mentors can exercise on the local teachers. And you see that it is effective in the sense that it reduced the amount of time in a given hour, this is in minutes, that the um, uh, teacher is out of the class, but this is not, so it is effective, but is not particularly differential between standard and plus. And the same, and another important outcome is uh, something that relates to these classroom observations and whether the instructor is able to keep the rhythm of the class and engage with students. And this again, uh, seems to be, although a little noisy, seems to be also positive and significant, but again, not differential between the two. We have also battery of other pedagogical practices indices constructed using the classroom observations modules, and none of this uh, seems to be responsive. Not only differential between standard and plus, but we don't detect any significant effect on pedagogical practices of this intervention. 
So panel B is a way to actually understand why we observe these effects on parents. And this has to do with another parts of the survey that has to do with the interactions between uh, the mentors and the parents. And you see that uh, here, of course, there is no control group. So there is the difference is just between plus and standard. And you see that plus is more effective First, there's an increase in the quantity of the visits, although this is, uh, and in the meetings in general, in the, in the last 60 days uh, in the API Plus, although this is not significant. And also the quality of the interactions between the parents and the mentors seems to be improving with the API Plus as measured by whether the mentors improve, uh, inform their parents about their child um, achievements and, and behavior in school and whether, and this is the last column, advise uh, the, the mentors advise the parents and give proper um, instructions and suggestions about how to help kids that are, that are struggling in some particular pedagogical dimension. So the last, the last part on the mechanism has to do with the remedial education session, which as I told you is the third component and, and in particular the most important component of their time in the communities is 60% of their time. And here, what we do is we take the sort of the uh, eligibility criteria of uh, based on the inverse rank in the class and we look at whether because of course this, this is not a part that was randomized separately from the program. The program was a bundle. And so here we try to look at the sort of differential effects along this rank within a rank distribution in the class uh, between, between kids that were eligible to receive the, the, these remedial education sessions and kids that were not based on whether they were ranked below or above seven. And here, uh, I have these sort of first stages or sort of the marginal effects of the probability of being part of this uh, remedial education session based on this uh, class, uh, inverted class rank that I can show you in case you're interested. So here you see that, uh, again, the plus seems to be more effective than the standard, but this is there is no differential effect for kids that are in the lower part of the ability distribution versus kids that are in the upper part of the ability distribution, and hence they're not eligible for the training. In fact, if you look at sort of the different diff of this is exactly zero. So there is no differential effect for kids that are uh, in the remedial education session uh, in terms of uh, uh, sort of that can explain any uh, any of the outcomes that I've shown you before in terms of the cognitive achievement. So uh, let me. Um, so you have like one more minute. Oh, I'm already done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I probably, I kind of, uh, so this is kind of what I said already. Uh, let me in this last minute show you two things about the program scale up. So as I said, the after the uh, learning about these experimental results, this CONAFE agency decided to expand the API Plus modality, this enhanced training to all the primary school in, in Mexico that were part of this CONAFE program, including the schools that were originally in the evaluation in, in the evaluation sample. So this allows us to do sort of a simple IV where we basically instrument the, ex, the, the exposure after the experiment using the original treatment assignment. And this is what we have here. And this allows us to basically benchmark with these IV results here in terms of transition to secondary, the um, results of one year of exposure during the scale up versus the one year of exposure in the experiment. And those are, if you remember, this was a, a let me, let me tell you here. This is a 9% and we compare with one year of exposure, which is something I didn't show you because I showed you the pooled effect, which was nine, but the one year exposure is six. So this is very much in line. And in fact, the, the scale up effect is kind of slightly larger, although we cannot reject it. They're different than the, 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 the experimental results. Uh, I don't think I have time to go further. Do I, Martin? No. So let me just wrap up. Um, so we provide evidence on both experimental and net scale impact of a mobile mentor program implemented in marginalized areas of Mexico. We trace out a mechanism uh, of the program, both in the small scale experiment and uh, uh, try to understand why the program was successful at scale. And, uh, and so we, we basically show that a scalable possible intervention in a low resource environment can effectively contribute to close the gap between children in urban and rural communities. Thank you, sorry for running out of time. Great, thank you very much. Um, so next is Amy, I think is here. 
So thank you for putting our paper in the program. Uh, this is a joint work with Julieta Caunedo and uh, Namrata Kala. Both of them are with us today online. My name is Haiming Zhang and I'll be on the job market this fall. My primary field of research is in empirical industrial organization. This project is motivated by the expansion of rental markets for equipment. Rental markets grant access to capital to small scale producers that would typically find it unprofitable to purchase a machine, which is a large indivisible uh, investment. Production in the developing world is usually small scale and concentrated in agriculture sector where the production is also low scale. Governments in the developing world are increasingly intervening in these markets, but the distributional and efficiency effects are not well understood. In this project, we construct an assessment of allocative efficiency of these markets. First, we describe what type of farmers access rental markets and highlight two important features of this market. In the case of agriculture, demand is synchronous in time and this generates congestion and delays. And also equipment needs to travel to meet the demand. This generates economies of density. We see a wide range of government policies that intervening in the rental markets. And oftentimes one of the goals of these policies is to increase the accessibility to the small farmers. We are therefore interested in a normative question. Are these policies effective in achieving its goal? And if so, at what costs? So for that, we will explore a uh, model of frictional rental markets and focus on a specific type of government intervention, which is a public-private partnership initiative in the south of India. And there, the government sets up rental hubs, subsidizes the purchase of equipment, and lets the a private sector operate them. These hubs are required by the government to deliver the rental services on a first come first serve basis. This means the providers cannot prioritize orders based on order size or location. So we find that in our sample, most farmers, large or small, they have some engagement with the rental market, in particular for expensive equipment. Rental demand is synchronous. This leads to congestion and demand is also clustered in space. Larger farmers usually face shorter delays in service provision, but those are mostly due to their location. So from our quantitative assessment and the counterfactual analysis, we find that the government intervention does give access to small farmers who would otherwise have been left out of the market. For the large farmers, the increase the capacity built by the government reduces congestion and lowers their wait time and productivity costs. But large farmers do face a higher price than before due to the higher overall demand. However, when providers prioritize uh, profitable orders, small farmers lose access again, despite higher capacities built in the market. So let me dive right into the talk. I'll first describe rental arrangements in rural India, then present the model and do our normative analysis. So we use three main data sources. First, we use data that Julieta and uh, Namrata collected through a survey of 7,000 agriculture households. This data has details on asset ownership and rentals as well as farm productivity. Second, we use data from a census of 41,000 farmers that use information on asset ownership and rental market engagement. Third, we use transaction data of the government setup hubs from our data partner with detailed information on hours of services, prices, et cetera. In, uh, in addition, we also use supplemental data such as the ICRISAT household level panel data. So first I would like to show you patterns of ownership versus rental of equipment across farmers in our survey. So the graph on the left shows the percentage ownership of different types of equipment. So a fair share of farmers do report that they own hand tools or animal pod equipment and less than 10% of the farmers report to own larger 
uh, equipment such as tractors or rotavators or cultivators. At the same time, on the right panel, we can see that tractors and cultivators are among the most rented pieces of equipment. So they have the highest equipment uh, hours rented. And the average hours rented for a tractor per farmer for a season is about 12 hours and for cultivators is about 10 hours. Second, I would like to describe the synchronicity in demand that I discussed in the introduction. So in this graph, you can see the number of hours outstanding of, uh, for service against time. These are daily hours outstanding for service for a rotavator. So you will see demand peaks around uh, the end of July at about 40 hours. So finally, I want to show that this synchronicity in demand generates delays in service provision that are correlated with size. So the measure of delays in this regression are self-reported by our survey sample. In here, we regress delay, which is measured in days against land area. You can see there's a significant negative coefficient. This indicate that 1% increase in land area generates a 0.31% decline in number of waiting days for the equipment. Therefore, large farmers, they face shorter delays. However, once we introduce village fixed effect, this relationship becomes non-significant. This suggests a substantial contributor to this correlation is actually the location of the plots in space. So to understand the role of geography and the demand synchronicity for allocations, we develop a frictional rental market model with endogenous delays. So we extend she's 2002 paper on directed search in the labor market. And the main difference is that we allow a firm to fulfill multiple services within a period. This is to better reflect how the rental markets operate. This increases the complexity of the model substantially. Providers, they use different technologies to fulfill those services. And I will explain that in the next slide. Farmers in the market, they are heterogeneous in two dimensions. One is the size of their demand and two is their location. Queuing of farmers induces, productive, induces uh, delays and causes productivity losses. So there's, uh, in the model, there are F heterogeneous farmers, each with a location new. Among these farmers, a fraction S are large farmers who demand rental hours of KS, and the rest are small farmers who demand rental hours of KS minus. We assume KS is strictly higher than KS minus, and this is what we observed in the data. On the supply side, there are H rental service providers among them, there are two types. One type serves the queue of farmers following a first come first serve basis. And we call these providers first come first serve providers. These providers are the ones that are set up by the government and they account for a fraction of H. And the other type, they prioritize large farmers in dense areas. And this is to maximize profit. And we call them the market providers. When farmers decide on which provider to choose, they face a trade-off between lower rental price and longer queue. Therefore, the optimal rental prices determine the queue length. The timing of the game goes as follows. So providers, they post the rental prices and a selection criteria with commitment. The selection criterion here determines whether a provider gives priority to a large farmer over a small one. Farmers then decide whether and which provider to approach following a mixed strategy. And here the PIJ indicates the probability of farmer I approaches provider J. The mixed strategy determines the Q length QIJ. Providers then subsequently choose which ones to serve and this induces a service probability. This measures the conditional probability of a farmer I being served by provider J should I approach J. And last, farmers produce 
And if they don't get served, they will face a productivity cost from delay. So in here, we follow the literature and focus on a symmetric mixed strategy equilibrium in which the farmers of the same type have the same probability of approaching a given provider. So in the next section, we bring the model to the data to assess the, the impact of having a first come first serve system parallel to the market system. In particular, which type of farmers has access to the rental market, how severe is the delay, and what is the profitability of the providers. We focus on one of the largest first come first serve hubs located at Casaba Honsur and use the transaction data of Rotavator, which is uh, the most commonly rented equipment during the Karib season from June to October. So there are two blocks to our quantitative assessment. The first one involves finding the market prices of services and the queue length using the theoretical model. We saw for an uh, equilibrium in which farmers of all scales are served by both types of providers, as we observe in the data. We call this the status quo equilibrium. As we bring the data to the model, we find that in the data, we have much richer information on farmer heterogeneity. This includes hours demanded and the location. As a result, we adopt a simulation approach in order to take advantage of all this information. So what we do is we draw samples of queues from the empirical distribution of order sizes and location. We estimate their values using the results from the block one exercise. And then this will give us the following outcomes. So for the farmers, we're going to get uh, expected delay and productivity costs. And for the providers, we're going to get profitability and how they can optimize service provision in space. And on the last point, which the optimization is based, I don't have uh, enough time to go through today, but if you are interested, please read that in our paper, in the draft paper. So the majority of the parameters we use in the quantitative exercise, they are disciplined by the data. So first come first providers, they account for about 75% of all providers. And large farmers, which we define as farmers who demand over 3.5 hours of services, they only account for about 10% of the total farmer population. So for parameter F, which is the number of the ratio of the number of farmers and the number of equipment, we calibrated because we want to make sure the equilibrium Q length are broadly in line with what we observe in the data. So here, this figure shows us the joint distribution of service requested and the travel time from the hub. So you can see in this graph, there are two clusters of farmers and one cluster located relatively near to the hub with a dis travel distance of uh, like below 0.4 hours. And the other one is further away and the travel distance is between 1.2 and 1.4 hours. And within each cluster, we can see the distribution of the order size is rather similar. And the majority of the farmers, they demand uh, service between one and three hours. So the first step in the quantitative exercise is to use the theoretical model to characterize uh, the status quo equilibrium. So this on the left, uh, the table on the left, we can see the equilibrium rental prices. We can see that prices charged by the market providers are lower for both types of farmers. And on the right, we can see the Q length at equilibrium. Again, for the farmers, the Q length under um, the market provider, they are longer for both types of the farmers compared to the first come first serve providers. And this confirms that the farmers, they indeed face a trade-off between cheaper services and longer queues. So next, we carry out the simulation exercise uh, discussed before to determine how severe is the delay 
by farmers with heterogeneous sizes under each system. What we find is that waiting time is higher for all orders, except for the largest ones under the market allocation. So this is a direct consequence of the market provider prioritizing the large farmers. So we explore two counterfactual cases. In the first case, we explore a scenario in which the first come first providers, they adopt the technology of the market providers, which allow them to prioritize the large farmers. We also assume providers cannot exit the market in the short run. So we call this the short run market equilibrium. The two columns here compares the equilibrium Q length for small and large farmers, the rental prices, and also the expected per period profit of serving a small farmer and a large farmer under the first uh, under the status quo equilibrium and under the short round market equilibrium. So we can see the rental prices charged to both types of farmers are much lower in this short run market equilibrium. This is primarily because without any differentiation in services, the providers of both types they compete has on with one another, and this significantly diminishes their pricing power. Note that the expected uh, profit of serving a small farmer per period is now negative. This suggests that a profit maximizing provider will not serve small farmers. And in the second counterfactual case, we explore what happens in the long run when providers can exit the market. As demonstrated in the first case, providers will choose not to serve the small farmers in the absence of any government intervention. However, given the small number of large farmers, there will be overcapacity in the market and this leads to negative profits. So in the long run, we expect exist to take place until the expected profit of serving a farmer becomes zero. So panel three, the last panel, shows that after capacity reduction caused by exit, the capacity per farmer is, is, has fallen by 88% from 0.26 to 0.03. So this dramatic reduction in capacity causes the Q length to increase by five folds. And also the large farmers, uh, and this is for the large farmers who continue to get served. So as a result, they experience much longer wait time. In conclusion, what we find is mechanization is a key to improving productivity in agriculture and timely access to service is important for farmers' returns, particularly for small farmers. But geography is a non-trivial problem to solve, and we face important uh, trade-offs between efficiency and market access. Our counterfactual analysis suggests that by setting up a system that follows a different dispatching system, small farmers that would not otherwise have access to the market are now served. The impact on the large farmers is mixed. So they do benefit from shorter wait time and thanks to the increased overall capacity, but at the same time, they face higher prices due, uh, due to incre increased overall demand. However, once the government stops regulating these first come first serve providers and allow them to become profit driven, we expect them to adopt this, the dispatching system of the market provider. So this will, as demonstrated, will eventually lead to small farmers losing access to the rental services and the large farmers, they suffer from a longer wait time and a greater productivity losses, even though they do pay a lower price. That's all I have to do. Great, thank you very much. Um, that was a really interesting chat, and also there's a long chat, so we'll lost some follow-up questions mm -hmm. uh, in the post session. So now it's um, Alexander and Michael are presenting on bulk discounts. If you guys want to start sharing your slides, um, hope everybody can hear me. 
Uh, excellent, thank you. And everybody can see my screen. So I'm Alexander Prasad. I'm working with Michael Olabisi, who's here and is monitoring the chat. Thank you to the organizers and thank you to everybody here who's participating and giving us feedback. The title of our presentation is, Are the Poor Missing Out on Bulk Discounts for Food? Evidence from Tanzania. Michael's at AFRI at Michigan State. I'm at the University of Richmond. So the motivation behind this is a fundamental econ idea of the law of one price and thinking about whether or not this law of one price actually holds. Because empirically, what we observe is that poor households often pay higher prices for the exact same good. And because food is consistently a large share of household spending in developing countries, the price that people pay for food could have some really large welfare effects and can also have some implications for public policy, particularly if public policy does not take these types of price differentials into account. There's a long lit on different topics that we're going to sew together today. So first is credit constraints and thinking about how liquidity constraints or short-term liquidity constraints can affect people's consumption. So we mentioned a few from the 80s, 2000s more recently on how people can actually um, make suboptimal decisions based on being credit constrained. Mel Steffen's paper from 2003, third of the month about social security receipt and spending, I think is most close to what we're doing today. In terms of whether or not bulk discounts exist, there's a lot of evidence from around the world from developed countries to developing countries that they actually do exist. So we have some examples here from the US, the UK, from Israel, and then from middle income countries like Mexico and Colombia. There's also some evidence from Tanzania that we'll talk about later when we talk about calculating losses from bulk discounts. In terms of why these credit constraints matter and why they would matter in the context of bulk discounts, it's really difficult to finance consumption through borrowing as opposed to say investment in developing countries. So there's a long lit about this. This is not a world in which people can swipe credit cards and get short-term credit. This is a world in which people are paying cash. And so the inability to smooth consumption or expenditure over time is actually gonna have a really big bite on people. And finally, when we're thinking about this, we'll talk about this briefly in the model and use it as part of our setup. When we think about how people are making choices, there actually should be some sort of cost minimizing intertemporal purchase strategy. So Hendel and Nevo talk about this in the context of actually buying soda in the United States, a bit different, but the idea is that you can buy optimally and then store up goods for longer periods of time. So if people were able to do this and thus take advantage of bulk discounts, then there could actually be some major effects. Our approach here is to think about household consumption in the face of credit constraints. So people cannot actually borrow and they're gonna have these types of liquidity issues that I mentioned. We use really granular data on consumption from the 2011-2012 Tanzania Household Budget Survey, the HBS, which I'll talk about a little bit in about three or four minutes. We're gonna calculate household level unit values, which we should think of as prices. So the price paid divided by the quantity purchased. And then we link consumption to information about income and asset holdings, which we're going to use as a proxy for wealth. Just to give a preview of our results, since we have a limited amount of time and we're happy to answer questions, as I said, Michael's answering questions here, the poor do pay more for the same good. So there is this poverty penalty that is observed in other locations. One reason why is that the poor buy in smaller amounts, which provides an explanation, provides a mechanism, which is that bulk discounts do exist and they really do bite into the poor. Liquidity constraints, which are proxied by assets and the day of wage receipt are the things that prevent bulk purchases. So households, when they can actually take advantage of these, when they can't, they're hurt by these liquidity constraints and therefore do not take advantage of them. The losses from differential prices are non-trivial. So they're actually quite large and I'll give some evidence about how we calculate that in a few minutes. Because of time, we're just going to strip down the model to a little bit of intuition and then talk about some of the propositions that we actually test in the paper. So first we outline an optimal expenditure strategy to minimize costs. We borrow from Hendel and Nevo, as I mentioned, in which consumers can store goods over time. So this is really important for thinking about non-perishable or semi-perishable goods, things like grains, pulses, cooking oil, et cetera. This is not a standard Euler equation approach, which often is used to think about smoothing consumption over time. Instead, we're thinking about how a household could optimally spend, so how its expenditure could be made into an optimal expenditure strategy over a reference period of R. So think of say a month in which a household chooses to make purchases to maximize its utility. 
What's interesting, and I'll mention it here, fortunately we can't go into too many details due to time, is that it's actually optimal to have bulky purchases to take advantage of bulk discounts and then use bulky purchases to smooth consumption. Households have different short-term liquidity constraints and differential wealth, and that's gonna drive differences in their uh, actual strategy of purchases. From the model, we generate several testable propositions. We're mostly gonna focus on the first and the last one today due to time. So households pay lower per unit prices when they're less liquidity constrained. So within a month, households have flush days and lean days. So flush days are days near say income receipt when they're less constrained. They're more constrained in lean days and the time near their income determines how binding these liquidity constraints are and whether or not they're in a flush period or in a lean period. Households with higher wealth face less of a liquidity constraint in purchasing, which is what we might expect given standard economic theory about the ability to purchase and the ability to smooth over time. The day of maximal income is the day of the maximal spending on food. So again, going back to Mel Steffen's paper, people receive their income, go out to the market and purchase lots of items. Finally, liquidity constrained households are the ones that actually have the most to gain from bulk expenditures of non-perishable goods. So these are the households that currently lose out, but could gain by actually taking advantage of these bulk discounts. A brief overview of Tanzania before we jump to the data. It's still a predominantly rural country. 60 plus percent of people live in rural areas. And at the time of the survey, the GDP per capita was about $870, which was 1.3 million Tanzanian shillings. So this is an economy where people on average are living about two to three dollars per day. So we're really focusing on some extremely poor people and then some less poor people. We have daily spending on over 10,000 households in 692 categories of products and services. So again, a very granular data covering one entire year from October 2011 to September 2012. We capture almost 2 million household level individual transactions. So when a household goes and say buys cooking oil, that's going to be a transaction. Tomorrow when they buy it again, that's a transaction. So we have a lot of detailed data on this. We cover most of Tanzania, about two thirds of the regions in a stratified nationally representative sample. And the reason the data are so granular and so nice to work with is that an actual enumerator followed each household around to collect all of these transactions. So we're not worried necessarily about things like a recall bias or the inability to recall certain things. Instead, we actually have an enumerator going around following people recording these transactions. Food purchases, which is what we focus on today, represent about 67% of the data. That is to say about 67, two thirds of the purchases. In terms of the money value of this, we're talking about 45 to 50% of household budgets. So a quite large percentage. We separate food items by roughly 200 different unique product codes. I'll give an example of a product in a moment. We also have information on sociodemographic characteristics, household size, number of adults, et cetera, and then measures of things like assets, housing type, job, income uh, receipt, uh, time of the month, et cetera. Here's an example of a product that's actually split up. So instead of saying any type of cooking oil, we actually have a product code for Cori brand palm-based oil. So here is an example of Cori cooking oil from a producer and a distributor in, in Tanzania. And so this is one of those 199 product codes. So when we talk about granular data, we can actually separate say um, corn oil, soy oil, et cetera, different types of oils. So very granular data. In terms of how we think about this and going back to part of the motivation of households buying in small amounts, making suboptimal purchases, Households purchase food almost every single day. So we see here that households, almost a third of households purchase food 28 days in the month. So an extremely large number of households are purchasing food almost daily. And we can see with the skew that really this is the majority of households are purchasing basically every day or you know, two times every three days, et cetera. In order to talk about the impact of bulk discounts, we first establish that bulk discounts actually do exist. So we do this several ways in the paper. I'm just gonna show you the basic regression of unit values, which we should think of prices as the dependent variable measured against quantities as our main independent variable. We're gonna control for month. So that's alpha sub M. 
as well as location alpha sub c. So the important thing here is to say, as the quantity increases, does the price, the unit value decrease? We do this for the top 20 items, which account for about three quarters of spending. We split this up here to have more perishable products at the bottom, less perishable products at the top. And we see across the board that there is this type of bulk discount. So it's lowest in some products like rice or flour, but it's extremely high in some types of products like cooking oil, um, fresh fish, cooking bananas. So products that become, uh, that, that are more perishable seem to have a higher bulk discount. We're gonna test if wealthier households buy in larger quantities. We do this at the household level. So we have these same time and location fixed effects. And we're gonna look now at wealth. So how does wealth correlate to the quantity that people buy? Do wealthier households, or should we say less poor households, buy in larger quantities here? When we look at this, we actually see across the board, our beta Q here is important. As beta Q increases, this is an indicator that households are buying more as their wealth goes up. So we see across the board, again, this is positive. It's particularly striking for some products like palm oil, the Cory brand palm oil that I mentioned earlier, and some other products like cooking oil, sunflower oil. So we do see that there might be some evidence right away that wealthier households are the ones that are able to utilize bulk discounts the most. In terms of our testable propositions that I approached in the model earlier, we're gonna focus, as I said, on the first one, which is does timing of the month matter? So bulk discounts exist, as we just showed, the wealthy or the less poor use them the most, does time within the month actually matter? So we're going to use locale specific price indexes. So a person living in a particular geographic area, how does that person spend relative to other people in that area? And then we're gonna test whether or not liquidity constraints drive differences in the use of bulk discounts. Here, as I mentioned, the idea of flush. So the flush time of uh, the month, flush days, where households are able to spend more. So they're able to take advantage of bulk discounts and presumably have a lower price index. So we're really comparing households against themselves. We're going to include income type and some of our regressions so that we can think about how different types of income or the receipt of income affects these results. In the odd numbered columns, we have household level fixed effects. In the even columns, we use the dummies, as I mentioned, for type of income. As we can see, all households, so column one, when uh, households are flush, when they're able to spend more, they actually have lower prices. They spend on, on average a price index that's 2.3% lower. Now, when we compare this to columns three and five, where we split up households by above and below median wealth, we see that this is more important for households that are below median wealth. In other words, households that are poor or the most poor. This is unsurprising. So this is again, consistent with what we saw where households that are wealthier are able to take advantage of bulk discounts at more times and smooth across the month. We see that households that are the poorest really rely on these flush times of the month in order to take advantage of bulk discounts. In the even number columns, we have income type I won't talk too much about this in the interest of time, but we do see that the type of income, so whether or not you receive income uh, daily, monthly, um, monthly wage income only can affect your ability to take advantage of bulk discounts and therefore have a lower price index. In particular, workers who are paid monthly, so who have the lumpiest income are the ones that end up being able to take advantage of these types of bulk discounts. We're gonna estimate bulk discount losses. And what we do is we identify focal quantities based on a paper Dylan et al in 2020 that also looks at Tanzania. So we look at each item within a district within a month to identify focal quantities. So for instance, purchasing rice that I have here, half a kilogram, one kilogram, et cetera. These are focal quantities, which indicate say packaging or items that people might buy in, in common amounts. Once we identify these, say half a kilogram, one kilogram, five kilograms, we identify the smallest quantity with the lowest observed median price, so the lowest observed median, or sorry, uh, median unit value. So the example I give, we're actually going to use 
the unit value for one kilogram of rice because it's 1800 Tanzanian shillings versus say 1900 Tanzanian shillings for a smaller bag. So we're gonna define bulk discount losses as taking the price that households actually spent versus the price that they could have spent if this focal quantity price had been allocated to all the uh, units or all the quantities around. So instead of having a different price schedule for different quantities, if there were indeed just one price for all quantities. From there, we're going to aggregate across all the items, across all the days, so all the purchases. And we're going to define some kind of total loss here across the entire month. So we calculate loss relative to the amount that the household actually spent. Once we calculate this, we regress this against household wealth, so a measure of whether or not it's able to take advantage of bulk discounts, the perishable share of its spending. So as we saw, perishable items seem to have higher bulk discounts. And then we also look at own production. So own production is actually a proxy for being extremely poor, so not even participating in the market. We also control for several demographic variables, which we put here in X. What we see in column one, when we just run this on the wealth index and our uh, column X, so again, household, et cetera, household uh, demographics, et cetera, we see that households that are wealthier as their wealth goes up are the ones that actually have lower bulk discount losses. So negative coefficient here means lower loss. We see that this actually gets attenuated towards zero as, as we add in more variables like perishable share and own production share. In the last column, column four, we see that this wealth index is still statistically significant, though only at the 10% level and it's closer to zero. However, when we look at own production share, the third row, we see that this is actually quite statistically significant and relatively large. So own production share, as I said, is a proxy for poverty. So lower income, poorest households are the ones that produce a larger proportion of their own consumption. So these households are the ones when they actually do participate in the market that lose the most in the market. We control for rural areas. We actually see that the largest metro, Dar es Salaam, if you're there, you actually have a lower um, share of, of bulk discount losses. So overall, the main takeaway from this table is that wealth is important. And if we look at pair, or sorry, own production share as a proxy for poverty, being poor is also really important and they work in opposite directions. To conclude, I know that I'm probably coming very close to time. When we actually calculate this out and we can talk about this in uh, the chat or we can talk about this in the Q&A session, we find that bulk discount losses are roughly 10% of spending for the average household, so non-trivial. Wealth relaxes the liquidity constraints as we saw in the tables that I showed. And there's suggestive evidence here for financial frictions. So there's lack of smoothing across the month. So the inability of households to actually I, uh, optimally spend across the month and therefore take advantage of these uh, bulk discounts. The households that are limited to a single wage per month, that's the monthly income households, they're the ones who change their expenditure patterns more than other households, which is consistent with what we've seen in other contexts. So what we see here is again, overall evidence for the role of liquidity constraints and bulk discounts in explaining a food loss or excuse me, a loss for the poor. So thank you very much. Michael is here monitoring the comments. So olabcmmsu.edu and Alexander Prasad, aprasad at richmond.edu. Thank you very much for listening to our presentation and to the organizers. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you in Q&A or afterwards. Great, thanks so much. So we have uh, 17 minutes for comments, which hopefully we'll get some comments that are paper specific and some that are more broad for the sort of set of papers on thinking about inequality in these contexts. And then we'll take a 10 minute break um, and then we'll, we'll start the, the third session. Um, so uh, Mateo ran out of time. I'm, I'm sorry, the 20 minutes turns out to not be that much time. So, so I'll, I'll start with Chris's question, which hopefully will let you finish your presentation. Uh, so Chris, would you, do you want to you answer your question? Sorry, uh, yes. Um, yes, I was wondering if the, um, if part of the difference between the call, the, the effect estimated in the experiment and the effect of the overall expansion of the schooling program in Mexico might have been due to the, due to what you found in um, keeping schools open or more broadly, 
through other social interactions that get picked up in the large scale rather than in the experiment. Yeah, so um, I didn't have time to discuss this, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the effect on transitions that we find between the scale up and the experiment are before the school closures actually start kicking in. So the, the, the large, relatively small wedge between these nine point uh, something effects in the scale up and the 6% effect in the transition in the RCTs are very unlikely to be due to, do, to this differential school closure effect. They might be due to other things. Maybe this probably broader spillovers. It's true that the units of the randomization is pretty large. And this is one of the things that make us confidence that we can go from the RCT to the scale up. These are at the community level. There's only one school in the community. So, uh, and again, all the implementations, there are basically no implementation differences between the RCT and the scale up because we actually control that in this sort of control environment between the experiment and the scale up implementation. So uh, that's kind of one reason that make us confidence that these, these two scenarios are very comparable. And uh, I mean, again, it's slightly larger, but I, in fact, it's statistically indistinguishable from, from each other. So I wouldn't yeah. speculate too much about, about that. Um, And there was a long and active chat during Heming's presentation about the right way to think about search versus quality versus other mechanisms. So I thought it'd be useful to, to have all that. Tommaso, do you want to? I think Julieta. Sure. Sorry. I'm just happy. Uh, I guess I asked the question. The question is just I'm just curious to hear from like you know uh, the three authors. Uh, what are like you know your thoughts on like you know, using search fictions and happy to provide some thoughts there. Yeah, thanks, Tomaso. That's uh, I think it's a, it's a very good question. Sorry, in the in the chat, it was kind of uh, hard to fully uh, articulate. Um, so the model that we are using is a model of, of directed search, which is within the the class of of uh, um, competitive search models. And what that allows us to do is literally to use prices as uh, an allocative tool. So we have selection. These large and small farmers are being you know they're choosing where to. Um, kind of purchase their services, the rental services. And we thought that was a natural uh, way to think about it. And we also see queuing. And it's true that queuing is just, a, you know, kind of the natural outcome of having, um, you know, a mismatch between supply and demand. And, uh, you know, all those fluctuations in queuing in a model of, of competitive search, they come out, uh, you know, naturally. So we thought that that was the, the, correct, the correct way to do it. So the answer is two. One is the queuing that we see in the market. The second is that we really want to think about selection and sorting, right? These different type of farmers are choosing where to go and they're facing different prices and different waiting times because of those choices. But if you had- Can I have a brief, a brief reaction or, or diverge? No, I, I, no, I'm sorry. I just wanted to comment on that. If, if you just had a model where supply was smaller than demand and prices are, are rationed, I mean, you'd, you'd get queuing out of that. I mean, that that's... I, I agree. We also want to have sorting and, and that's why, well, sorting or, or selection into these different providers. And that's why we chose to have a, a model of competitive search. There might be other models out there that, that could handle this. This to us was the most, the natural way to, to think about the market. But, but Julieta, so if, if I can, like, I guess I wrote down like in a long comment on it, but so it seems that uh, if you have some sort of like, you know, quality differentiation, you may actually get like, you know, sorting, uh, sorting through that. Uh, or, and, uh, and so like, you know, I, I think it would be like you know, very useful to kind of have like, you know, some direct evidence for, for the search mechanism, because of course then like, it does all the heavy lifting, right? You know, in, in your model, uh, to my understanding, all the, the sorting is explained by, by search. Uh, by directed search, so then you're going to have like a you know, very big impact on the counterfactuals. Uh, it's really through prices. So the, the 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 thing that you need to, and that's what we are working on, and we have been working for for a long time, is that you really need to make sure that the model predict prices or relative prices for these rentals across different uh, um, different providers. That makes sense given the data. So point well taken. We are really working hard to generate those. And I think in we're going that way. We are we are not there yet, and that's why this is part of the of the working process. So if you have particular ideas of things that you would like us to to show, we'll be happy to take those too. 
I actually had just a very specific question there. How were you getting, I, I found it very interesting that let's say, let's say prices are fixed, okay? And then of course, as you said, conceptually it's unclear whether the smaller farmers have a low opportunity cost or the larger guys have a low, oh, whatever, managing that queuing system. Why is it that the larger guys are navigating it better? Is there bribery behind the scenes? What's going on here? So the, the, I think we didn't, and, and we were talking with Namrata vaccine to, to try to explain this. So the numbers that we show on delays at the beginning of the talk and in the beginning of the paper, these are, these are delays that are reported by the farmers, irrespective of whether they come from the market, provi market providers or the first come first serve. When you condition on the first come first serve, we see no difference because exactly the government the government designed the system exactly to do that. And kind of the takeaway is, yes, they, they gave access to the small farmers, but this has a huge cost. And once you let them behave as you know, market providers, then the market is again gonna unravel. That's, that's the takeaway. And then Alessandra, do you want to ask your question about sort of other reasons why poor households might be purchasing differently? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, right. I was just wondering about, about the potential importance of uh, factors such as, well, either present bias, like you, you, get your, your, you get your wage and you spend all of it, or uh, maybe the fact that we know that um, in many, there are many places where uh, people don't have a very effective way of savings uh, and so they may want to spend as soon as they get the money because they know that if they don't um, somebody else is going to waste the money that's left in some uh, wasteful way so um, just that thanks yeah thank you alessandro I, th I think i'll take this one uh, and, uh, there's a longer answer but the, the short version is that um the households in Adira span the regular monthly wage worker to the weekly wage worker to people who don't take wages. And just about uh, across all groups, you see everybody, when they get a chance, uh, they use bulk discounts. And then uh, when they don't, when it's the lean days of the month, um, uh, they can't use bulk discounts. They buy small quantities. And this is, of course, a bigger problem for those households that are poorer as measured by assets than the ones without it. So we, we are not, um, we, in fact, we, we strongly believe that uh, there's many other uh, drivers of uh, this kind of behavior. Uh, so the storage costs for money, just keeping money with his heart, um, the storage costs for, for stuff, either because people want it or it's because it goes bad. Um, and as I said in the text, about 15% of our households have fridges, and that's, that's all. And most don't. Um, but, but still, in addition to all that, uh, what we see seems to suggest that uh, if people uh, have some way to uh, finance consumption, and as uh, I just said in the chat, uh, we'll see a different behavior. I was kind of intrigued that the perishables uh, ha had more bulk discounts. I was just trying to think, you know, at least in this context. Didn't see. And, but that seems to mediate a little bit. Like, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, if, if the fish is not going to carry over till tomorrow, right? So what, you're just going to gorge on fish? So then it, it doesn't translate necessarily, you know, the welfare mapping isn't clear, right? Whereas with durables, it would have been super clear. Um, or something like rice, I guess it's pretty clear, right? Because rice is quite dur it's durable. So what's, what's your comment on that? How does that work out? Again, I'll, I'll hazard this one, Alexander, and you can add to it. Uh, our answer is exactly what you said. It's, it's not honestly 100% clear. And there's some mixture here. Um, we still see liquidity constraints and we still see what we see as a picture. Uh, but, but we also, yeah, we expect uh, our, our reading of the data is yeah, there's people who look, there's a, and at least when I could tell you this in the data, we see because we can see uh, the type of vendor that sold the food to you. So things like plantains. When you buy a plantain from a from a hawker, street hawker, not like a store, uh, you tend to get bigger bulk discounts. In which I, mean, I can rationalize. So what happens is the plantain will go bad by tomorrow, so I might as well just buy all of it and eat plants for the next two days, uh, which uh, might not be exactly uh, maximizing what you would like to eat, but in a sense, you just eat that food.
Uh, Michael, I believe in the chat you said that you have data on fridge ownership. You have direct a direct measure of that, right? So you might be able to to look into this and your data and kind of I don't know speak to you this this kind of storage mechanism a little bit. Uh, the, the, again, I can answer that quickly, which is that uh, yes, we do see actually that uh, fridge ownership uh, reduces some of the effect we see on uh, for perishables, uh, but it's it's interesting not. As great, and again, I could, I could say the reason why. The reason why is that uh, only I think in the data about just over a quarter have uh, electricity on the grid, and of that quarter, there's about half of them where the electricity is not even you know, very reliable. So it's one thing to have a fridge; it's another thing to have the power to run the fridge. Um, so that's. I don't know if there's a lot of that going on, but with perishable, um, one thing that you can do is to do, when you buy in bulk, you do a big meal and you invite your neighbors and then, uh, but it's expected then, you know, next week it's their turn. But that, so that might be a way to, to smooth things with the, the perishable consumption. Uh, sorry, thank you, Garance. Garance, I think you, you asked the most fundamental economic question today, which is, I mean, this is the, the, the contractual frictions between everybody. I mean, if you could, you could say you solve the problems in the world because I mean, whatever we all need, we can just take turns providing for one another. Uh, but, but the frictions that won't let us do it, I think are the same ones that prevent households from uh, creating their consumption union, quote unquote, that, that makes everybody happy. So um, I, I guess uh, to directly answer your question, we think there's a little bit of this happening, but probably uh, they can't see much of it happening because just uh, scheduling and arranging all that takes, uh, it's costly and we don't think households, house, all, the households can all bear that cost. But is there a large household effect like controlling for wealth? Do large households pay a, 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 a lower price? Again, going back to this. Uh, yes, we see some, uh, but we were surprised that it's it's not as much. I mean, uh, wealth predicts uh, the use of box discounts more than household size, and others have actually studied this and they theorize or they suggest, with some evidence, uh, that uh, even in large households, the cost of coordinating purchases um, uh, makes uh, makes it hard to to use bulk discounts um, because if everybody has to kind of plan and agree, we're going to buy this much and share. Rather than you know, I buy this and I buy this, and then we get them and find out how much we all need. Um, um, so again, plan. Just this goes back to the last question: planning and coordinating uh, is costly. I'll also add, and this goes to both of the previous questions: people are buying extremely small amounts. So we we have some summary statistics which we did not show, but some people are buying, you know, um, like. 50, 100 milliliters of cooking oil. So these are really, really small amounts. They're not really buying the amounts that we might expect if they are, say, feasting with other people next door. There's some macro work related to this. Um, I wonder if these guys are buying at the same places. Uh, people have talked about refrigerators, but uh, anything to transport the food, um, if you're buying in bulk, becomes an issue how far you're going to get that. Um, there's a difference between the cost of your time and the, your wealth, right? So you, the time cost in shopping matters. I think David mentioned his research uh, in, the, in the literature. And then I think that the, the inventory clearing costs are key. I guess I, I like the paper, but I was, it kind of, I felt like it jumped to um, financial frictions right away, whereas it could just be these other things uh, inventory carrying costs. Um, oh, it was another thing I was going to mention, but I can't remember it, so I'll skip. Yeah, thank you. I mean, again, uh, just, just to respond to that, I mean, for me, the one that I find most fun or interesting is uh, uh, the friendly neighbor who shows up at dinner time, uh, just in time for dinner, uh, because they saw you come from the market with a bag of rice, and they know you can afford to feed them. Um, and, and they won't feed you when it's their turn. So, I mean, there's all these social demands on storage and it's you know, storage expensive. So again, we, we recognize that there's this other 
reasons that may motivate people to uh, just buy in small quantities and cook all everything you buy and then eat all of it in once. Um, yeah, I um, remember the other paper, which is in the U.S. Uh, with uh, like food stamps. I realize it's a very different population, but it's a poor population in the U.S. And, and there the issue is actually that they buy all their food at once and they don't manage it over time uh, very well. So the move is to actually put it in smaller uh, quantities stretched out across a month for, you know, food to, for food um, smoothing. Great. Thanks for your thoughtful comments and for the great presentations. I don't want to give people a 10 minute break just because I'm staring at a screen all day is tiring, but I think we'll, we'll leave it up. We won't lock the screen. So if you guys want to, if you want to chat or, or just talk about the, the papers like we would if we were in person, um, that'll be available and we'll, we'll pick up again in, in 10 minutes with the cash transfer uh, session. Thanks very much. Uh, Michael and Alexander, I wanted to ask you a quick question unless you need to go to the break. Um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so uh, I, I, I sent this link in the chat and I know you're aware of the paper because you cited it, uh, Brian Dillon and co-authors paper in the same context. They seem to focus on other types of constraints and I'm wondering how you think of your work in relation to their work and why you're focusing on credit constraints instead of um, the things that they're highlighting in their paper. Um, I take it, Alexander. Right, yeah, so the, 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 short, the short answer is we, we see our papers as, as very strongly complemented to Dylan in all's paper. Um, and I guess the motivation in some sense is uh, uh, a little bit of like, my own personal experience. I, mean, I grew up in a relatively poor you know, household in a developing country. Uh, so uh, I, I thought it was important to uh, add a little perspective uh, Again, without in any way discounting um, uh, the findings uh, from uh, recent papers. So again, we, we see uh, many of the, the points that they mentioned in terms of coordination costs, uh, storage costs, uh, intra-household negotiation, and uh, like Alison, Alessandro mentioned, mentioned um, you know, uh, uh, partners that want to control the budget or misuse the budget. Uh, uh, we see all this there, but we, we thought this deserves to be highlighted. Yeah. Morgan, is that the one that's with Michael Kramer? Uh, I don't remember. Sorry for not remembering all that. It's Brian Dillon, Joaquin. I think, I think it's, uh, I don't know who uh, Van de Wert. Yeah. Um, I think, I think, um, I I think Michael has a paper about, um, it's, a, it's a related paper about um, small scale retailers. So it's not on the consumer side, but bulk discounts of small businesses yeah, um, that you might find of interest. I don't, I'm not super familiar with this literature, but my instinct is it would be really interesting. I don't know if this is what you guys have in your data, but like really high frequency data on cash flows and spending, I feel like could help you think carefully about a lot of the things that people were raising and kind of the relative importance of something like credit constraints or the kind of bulk purchasing on payday or, you know, this kind of thing. I don't know if that's something you have or it's something that the other co-authors have had, or I don't know what you think about that. I mean, we feel lucky not to even have the data that we have, which is you know, expenditure and consumption data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, income data is really hard to come by and it's, it's really hard to come by uh, ones that either have the, the quantity, the, the volume we have or the, or the reliability that, that what we have. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a sense, the fact that we can tell uh, what day people are buying things and we can tell what kind of household they are, whether they're well, two house, two income household or single income household, whether it's month end wage or uh, sorry, monthly wage or not monthly wage, I mean, that, mm -hmm. that for us uh, is huge. And then again, we feel very fortunate that we found what we found, uh, yeah. that, that, that those households that are monthly wage earners are some of the ones most affected by this idea of, well, we got money now, let's quickly use bulk discounts um, and, and the part of the month, you know, the lean part of the month when there's no money, we can see them quite literally uh, uh, yeah, buying just enough to cook. I'm gonna run for a five minute break, but this is a really interesting project. I liked what all the things you made me think about. So thanks guys.
Guys, can I ask a question about perishability again? Just, just thinking about it more. So imagine that we have categories of different items and we go from durable all the way to the most perishable category that you can find. Now, when, you, when we go like super, super perishable, at that point, it's unclear what the role of wealth is unless you're just distorting the consumption, right? And at that point, really something like household size should matter more for the very perishable class. And when you'd run the gamut and go the other way towards durable, then wealth comes back into its own and household size should lose significance. Now, I don't know whether you have the fine grain data to look at this, but if this does not happen, then something like what Garance is saying, which you called uh, correctly a very fundamental question, maybe something like that is at play, right? Because even when you go to very perishable stuff, if, if it's still wealth that's driving it and not household size, then it may be that the community is cooperating or, you know, the local community is cooperating in some way and, hey, come over and eat tonight or whatever. Uh, so it, 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 I, I don't know whether we have enough power to do this, but it seems like something worth uh, thinking about. Anyway, very interesting. We, we are on it. <laughs> okay, see you guys. You guys have yeah, put in a, a simple request here. The uh, it's Alexander, Michael, nice to see you all. I think I agree with Joe Joseph's Joe Kowalski's comment about that you jumped to liquidity constraints a little too quickly um, in the presentation, anyway. Um, but one thing that I think would be helpful to see. By the way, in principle, I love liquidity constraints, so it's not that I'm against it, and I'm glad that you didn't jump to anything. Uh, uh, like behavioral, uh, you're going through standard things first, but go well, ahead. I, I love jumping. So, you know, we're, we're on the same page. Just, um, but I think a simple test would be to just try to, you know, in, in the spirit of, I think the, the Raj's comment about perishability, you know, there's sort of some notion of a depreciation rate being different across products. You can also quantify sort of the implied rate of return of buying a slightly big, bigger package, right? And that tells you something about you know, how bad the, how, how sort of, how much money they're leaving on the table in terms of saving and how does that compare to other rates of return that they face on saving and investing? Because, um, you know, it, it just, to, just to sort of calibrate this. Uh, and the other thing too is that, you know, usually, um, usually like in the micro enterprise literature, people say, you know, you, you, they find some like outlandish rate of return and they go to the thing that's really hard to observe. They say, oh, well, there must be really big fixed costs or something, right? And, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, but here, you know, that's not so, maybe like you, fish are lumpy. I suppose rice are lumpy too, in the sense that you can't buy half a grain, but that's pretty darn continuous in some sense, right? And, and you even say that the packages can be broken into bits, which I, I've seen that behavior as well, and always sort of bemused me. Um, but it, it can't be that, right? It can't be that they're, they're being stuck out of some higher return by that, by, you know, and, and so I, I think some comparison of the, the rates of return compared to the depreciation rates, I think would be helpful. And um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Hoyt. Um, yeah, that makes sense. We've talked a little bit about this and going back to the previous question about perishability and, and the depreciation rate. We've talked a little bit about this comparing it to household size. I don't know off the top of my head and Michael can chime in if we have some information on something like that. Uh, but this is a great uh, direction. Thanks for suggesting it. And also, since I know you personally, I'm going to say I never make lumpy rice. So I, I don't know if rice is really lumpy. Well, presumably you don't measure it down to the fraction of a grain, though. Not, not these days. No, no right. <laughs> this, is, this, is your, this is your newfound wealth. <laughs> so, Michael and Alexander, I thought this was really interesting. I had one kind of question slash suggestion, which is more econometric than economic, which is just, it'd be really interesting to see how much of the variation that you're using is across versus within product. 
Because I think you ideally want everything within product or as much of it as possible within product. And the additive fixed effects are going to get you most of the way there, but they're not exactly getting you the way, all the way there. And so, for example, look at what are the products that people are spending most of their income on and how much that overlaps at different levels of wealth, I think would give you a really clean understanding of exactly what bit of variation identifies the parameters. You might already have this, but if not, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, we, we do have this. And, and I think um, in the full paper, we, you know, we, we basically tell you that, you know, uh, 12% of, budget, most house, the, of the average household budget is spent on rice, and you know, that's 78% of households are by rice. And beef is the third largest budget item, but only 16% of households buy, you know, well, this is beef without bones in it, basically, sorry, beef with bones. Like, you know, and the beef without bones, which is basically steak, is like, you know, by less than 1% of households, and that's still in a large of the total spending because, yeah, for those households, it's going to be so oh. So I have to, I have to interrupt because it's it's now time, to, but hopefully yeah, you guys can chat, to, you know, yeah. offline and how, how this is. All right. So we're, so thanks for for sticking around for the the last session of this uh, young economists spread pre session. Um, so the last section is going to be all focused on cash transfer kinds of papers. So. Right, thanks a lot. Thanks for all being here. Thanks uh, to the organizers for putting us on the program. Uh, this is joint work with Joaquin Didier Martin who. Uh, should be on the call to answer clarifying questions. Can you guys all hear me okay? Okay. So a big motivation for this paper is the fact that the effectiveness of education policies vary widely across settings. And so, you know, specifically if we think about policies that reduce the cost of schooling, uh, which includes financial aid policies, private school vouchers, conditional cash transfer programs, um, and if we look at the effects of these types of programs across settings, um, they're documented to have quite a wide range uh, of effect sizes. And that's even when we're thinking kind of within each of, each of these categories of policies. Uh, in fact, as we discovered sort of in the early stages of this, um, of this project, even within a single program in a single country, we have substantial variation um, across states in the effectiveness of this program. And so what I'm showing you here um, is a figure plotting the effect of Mexico's progressive program, a conditional cash transfer program on educational attainment. And this first point here shows that overall, um, the progressive program increased educational attainment by about 0.2 years. Um, and in the remaining points, we see that when we break down this regression by state, so there are seven states in this evaluation sample, uh, we see one really one state that had a really large effect, two kind of more moderately sized effects, but still uh, statistically significant. And then in four out of the seven states, really no effect at all. So these are uh, obviously not statistically significant, but also very close to zero. And so given this, and given you know the, the literature I cited on the previous slide, uh, what we're interested in understanding in this project is what drives this, this heterogeneity in education policy effectiveness. Um, motivated by a model, we're going to focus on labor market conditions as a driver of this heterogeneity. And in order to analyze this empirically, we're going to need you know, a specific program. And as you may have guessed, we're going to be looking at, at the progressive program uh, in our empirical analysis. So just to preview what we find before diving into the details, uh, we first show that Mexico's progressive program was less effective in states with more blue collar and manufacturing jobs. And so to, to expand on this largely descriptive analysis, uh, we end up focusing on export manufacturing, so a specific type of blue collar and manufacturing job, um, which has a couple of advantages that I'll discuss later. And consistent with the first bullet point, we find that um, Progresso was once again less effective in areas with more of these export manufacturing jobs. Now, based on you know combining the theoretical predictions of the model with some follow-up empirical analysis, we come to the conclusion that this is due to the fact that these export manufacturing jobs generate more convex opportunity costs. So, in terms of literature, just briefly, um, our work relates to a large literature on documenting the relationship between schooling levels, returns to schooling, and opportunity costs. There, there are a lot of really good papers in this space. Uh, one 
distinction I want to make, though, is that our interest in this paper is not on what, you know, what determines schooling levels, but, but rather on, as I've said, the effectiveness of, it, of an education policy. And so the way we think about this is you know, the magnitude of the schooling response to a price reduction. Um, there's also a large literature on heterogeneity and CCT effectiveness, both about progressives specifically as well as CCTs more generally. Um, a lot of these papers look at you know, heterogeneity by gender or by poverty levels. Again, the, the distinction I want to make here is, is that our focus is on labor market conditions uh, as a driver of heterogeneity. And so why, why do we care about labor market conditions? Uh, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes outlining this model, which, um, which highlights kind of why, why we care. So, uh, here we have parents maximizing discounted future wages minus the opportunity cost of schooling and the opportunity cost of schooling is composed of foregone wages, C of S, as well as, you know, actual tuition costs, two times S. Uh, optimal schooling levels are determined by this expression, but as I've already emphasized, our interest is on how schooling responds to a price reduction. And so this negative DSBT here gives us that um, uh, gives us gives us the, that uh, that exactly, and we have here, um, as has been shown empirically, and as you know, as is intuitive, schooling should increase when you reduce the price. But more specifically, if we if we you know think about what drives this term here, that can help us shed some light on you know what will drive different what will generate differences in the magnitude um, of this response. And what we can see is that labor markets will um matter in the sense especially specifically the types of jobs that are available to an individual and, and those things are, those are going to affect its expression through these two channels so first um the types of jobs that are available to individual are going to affect that individual's perception of the wage function and so this term right here the second derivative of wages with respect to schooling um enters this enters this expression and what we have are what we have here is more rapidly decreasing or else less rapidly increasing marginal benefits, just a smaller second derivative, that should lead to a smaller schooling impact. Um, but that's not the only place where jobs will come in because you know the types of jobs available are also going to affect the types of jobs a, a potential student could be taking right now, or in other words, the opportunity cost function. Um, and so that's gonna matter as well. And in this case, when here if we have more convex cost functions, this is what's going to lead to a smaller schooling impact, so a larger second derivative here. Um, I'll also mention now that another important factor is the equilibrium level of S, because um, that's going to determine kind of where we are on the curve, uh, and so we're going to keep that in mind in our empirical analysis. But I think, you know, this discussion should make it clear that it's not going to be easy to um, predict ex ante what you know, what a certain type of labor market condition is going to do to the school to schooling response that we're interested in. We don't typically have good measures of these second derivatives. And so therefore we turn to an empirical um, analysis of this question. And to do that, we're going to focus on Mexico's progressive program. Uh, as most of you probably all know, it was one of the first CCTs started in 1997 in poor rural Mexico. Um, the education component, which is the main thing that we're interested in, involves cash transfers to mothers of children who attended at least 80% of school days. Um, and there's a health component as well, which we're not gonna talk much about in this uh, presentation. And again, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the experimental design of this program allowed for rigorous evaluation of the program effects. And uh, the, uh, when I say experimental design, what I mean is that a randomly selected slightly over half of the sample, uh, half of the villages, this is a village level randomization, uh, started receiving the program in 98, whereas the remaining control localities or villages started receiving the program at the end of 99. And so by now there are over 100 studies looking at Progressive, but the main relevant finding for our study is the fact that Progressive significantly increased uh, enrollment and attendance in the short run and eventual educational attainment in the long run. So in terms of our data sources, we, we draw on three sources of data. Obviously we have this progressive data, 
That gives us our outcome variables, uh, educational attainment and attendance, as well as our controls. We, uh, from, we take from the census data, um, or we obtain from the census data information on geographic variation in job types, as well as some other state level characteristics. And finally, when we shift our focus to export manufacturing jobs, we're gonna um, use the Mexican Social Security Institute data, the IMSS data, uh, which we have from 97 to 2003. Um, in the interest of brevity, I'll just state kind of what we get at the end of you know, our cleaning with the IMSS. We have the number of male and female export-oriented manufacturing jobs in each subdelegation. Uh, Export-oriented is defined by industry using the definition from Atkin 2016, and a subdelegation in Mexico is an area, a geographic area that's smaller than the state, which, is, uh, which we care about because there are only seven states uh, in the sample, but larger than a municipality, and that's going to be important because in most municipalities in the sample, there's no variation in treatment and control. So we wanted uh, something larger than that to, to encompass more variation. In some analyses, we're gonna end up distinguishing between young and old jobs, as well as low wage and high wage jobs. So we begin with some motivating evidence, um, kind of going back to the state le level heterogeneity that I showed you on the first slide, to try to see to the extent to, uh, to which this could be driven by occupation types. So we start with occupation types and then moves on to industry composition. So I'm just plotting here the progressive treatment effects that I've already shown you at the state level uh, by white collar shares and by blue collar shares. Here kind of the more striking result is that blue, there's a negative correlation between blue collar jobs and uh, progressive treatment effects where larger, we see smaller treatment effects in areas with more blue collar jobs. When we look at this by industry, again, we, so we break it down, we look at the three most common industries in Mexico and, and in these seven states. Um, again, the more striking figure here is this manufacturing figure where we see a very strong, almost linear ne negative correlation between progressive treatment effects and manufacturing, uh, where once again, high manufacturing areas have smaller progressive treatment effects. I'm not gonna spend too, too much time on this because you know this is at the state level with only seven states. There's not much we can do. Manufacturing is correlated with lots of other things. We do show some additional figures in the paper suggesting that you know manufacturing does seem to be kind of the most correlated with treatment effects. Um, but we move on instead to, to, a, to a more formal regression analysis. And for this, we are going to focus on a specific type of blue collar manufacturing job. And as I've already mentioned, we're gonna focus on export oriented manufacturing. Now, why we do this for a couple of reasons. So first of all, the progressive program coincided with a period of rapid trade liberalization. During this time period, manufacturing was a key driver of growth. So it was just an important phenomenon at the time. Um, the other nice thing about export manufacturing is that it's not driven solely by local supply and demand. It's also driven in large part um, by external shocks. And um, we can see that when we look at the correlation between or overall, if you look at the correlation between overall manufacturing and um, income, say income or education levels at the subdelegation level, um, that correlation is much stronger than the correlation between say export manufacturing and those same things. Uh, the other nice thing about export manufacturing is that it allows us to use the IMSS data, um, which has a number of advantages. It's, you know, we have it every year, it's the entire universe of formal sector jobs, um, and so forth. Okay, so now um, to move on to the empirical specification, we, we start with educational attainment observed in 2003 as our outcome variable. And so I'll note here that by 2003, both the treatment and the control group we're receiving the program. And so we can think about these effects as the effects of having a pro the program for two years longer. Um, we regress educational attainment on a progressive treatment dummy, which is a village level dummy. Um, this jobs variable, which I'll describe in a second, but what we're interested in is that interaction between treatment and jobs. Um, jobs here is the average number of export oriented jobs for gender G, subdelegation F, averaged over this period and then, and then standardized. Um, we have a control. We add a but treatment by female interaction as well as other interactions later and we cluster our standard errors at the village level. 
We also, so that's, you know, looking at educational attainment at the kind of at the end of the program. We also look at contemporaneous effects on attendance while the treatment group was getting the program, but the control group was not. Uh, so in this specification, we have multiple waves, uh, the baseline wave and those three follow-up waves while the control group was not getting the program yet. So the additional variable we have in this specification is just this post dummy equal to one for waves after 97. Um, so now the, you know, the overall effect of progressive is, is given by beta two, you know, treatment by post. Um, and now the interaction we're interested in is this triple interaction here and everything else is pretty similar. Um, so starting off with um, this first column, what these results show us are first of all, that treatment, as we know, had a positive and significant effect on um, educational attainment, and this, because we've standardized the export jobs variable, this is giving us the effect for the average subdelegation. However, for areas with more export jobs, we see that this effect is um, significantly smaller. Uh, the effects are similar when we include a treatment by female interaction. We thought this was important because these export jobs, the export jobs variable is um, gender specific. So we wanted to make sure we were not just picking up gender differences in the treatment effect. Um, and then, Effects are pretty similar, interactions slightly smaller when we include a full set of uh, household demographic and composition controls. Uh, moving on now to our attendance results. Here, as I, as I mentioned, this treat by post, this is now what gives us you know, the overall effect of Progressa on attendance for the average subdelegation. So we see positive and significant effects over here. But once again, we see this negative interaction term telling us that these attendance effects were significantly smaller in areas um, with more export jobs. What's nice about this specification is that it has a, a number of kind of built-in falsification checks. For example, we shouldn't expect treatment to affect attendance in the baseline period. We shouldn't affect treatment and export jobs to interact in the baseline period. Um, but one thing that we do is that towards uh, in the third and sixth columns, we just drop all of these uh, interaction terms to, to use a more parsimonious spec. The reason I'm showing this is because later when we add mo more interactions, we're going to start with this more parsimonious specification. And so our results show that um, progressive effects were smaller in areas with more manufacturing, export manufacturing jobs. So that must mean that based on, you know, what we, what we outlined in the model, this, this must mean that export manufacturing jobs must result in a, either a lower uh, wage second derivative or a higher opportunity cost second derivative. And so uh, looking at the time, I might have to go quickly through these, but basically what we find is that, you know, we don't have great um, measures of these second derivatives, but you know, this proxy for it uh, is, I'm showing you income by schooling separately for areas with lots of export jobs compared to areas with fewer export jobs. This actually suggests that there's a steeper increase in marginal benefits um, in areas with export jobs. But this, if anything, should lead to a larger CCP impact. However, when we look at um, when we look at our, our proxies for opportunity cost convexities, what we see is that, um, if anything, there, so it seems to be the case that areas with export jobs have a more co convex cost function. So here we're showing, you know, income by age for these young age cohorts, employment status by age for those young age cohorts, uh, it increases faster in these export job areas. And so this should indeed lead to a smaller schooling uh, CCT impact, which is what we find. Um, and so in order to delve into this a little bit more, we asked a couple of questions. We first asked what age cohorts are driving our results? And what we find is that it's, the heterogeneity is mostly driven by working age cohorts. So those 15 and older who are actually old enough to be working at the factories. Um, and when we can also ask, so that was kind of at the individual level, the in, what you know, characteristics of the individual level. Um, we can also ask about what types of jobs are driving our results. Um, and here we find that these low wage jobs and jobs for younger workers, so the things that would actually factor into the opportunity cost of schooling, Th those are the jobs that are driving the heterogeneity that we find. Um, of course, you know, so export manufacturing could be correlated to lots of other things. We do spend 
um, quite a bit of time in the paper looking at various characteristics that could be driving the heterogeneity. We include treatment interactions with each of these characteristics in our robustness checks um, sub at the subdelegation level as well as at the household level. So we look at you know subdelegation level educational attainment, income, urban shares. Um, at the household level, we look at job types, siblings, work status, uh, per capita income. Uh, temporary migration of household members, and I don't know why I, I list, forgot to list kind of an important one here, the baseline schooling levels of, um, of the child. And so this is a short presentation. I'm not going to uh, repeat what, what we found, but I will end with a couple of, um, a couple of concluding thoughts. So we find here that export manufacturing, by increasing the convexity of opportunity costs, reduces CCC effectiveness. And I think this sheds light on the importance of considering that, you know, for policies to policymakers to consider the interaction uh, between various policies and development goals. Um, and finally, this also tells us that labor market conditions could be an important driver of policy effectiveness in general, uh, of which we see lots of heterogeneity um, in the real world. All right, thanks for your time. Thanks so much. So next is Bonner and Steve talking about uh, thank you so much for having us. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. This is a uh, joint work with uh, Steve O'Connell, who is uh, in the audience, and uh, he will be monitoring the chat. So uh, please don't hesitate to ask any questions that you have. Um, let me just uh, introduce what we're trying to do in this, uh, in this paper. So we're interested in basically the impact of unconditional cash transfers. Uh, they are very popular anti-poverty tools. and their immediate uh, benefits are well documented as well in the uh, development literature. Uh, why are they popular? Because they're easy to implement, they're transparent, and, and they directly target the, uh, the credit constraints, which are considered to be the cornerstones of poverty traps. Mm -hmm. uh, they help households, impoverished households, to satisfy basic needs, but uh, their impact might go beyond uh, that. They, they uh, 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 through, uh, through, uh, through generating room for savings or re reducing reliance on, on expensive credits. So they might actually have the potential to, uh, to move uh, households to a sustained better equilibrium to, through, uh, through relaxing credit constraints, basically. Um, there's an alternative approach to poverty, which to acknowledge the uh, multidimensional aspect and the complex aspect of, of poverty and, and the anti-poverty programs therefore need to address the multiple issues that create poverty traps and exclusively focus on the nominal uh, uh, cash uh, will not lead to a sustained improvement. So in this paper, we're basically trying to kind of contribute to answer these questions. It's uh, uh, repeatedly asked, well, are the cash transfer tools are just, just very effective tools to, to provide temporary relief or, or could they uh, provide sustained poverty uh, alleviation? So, uh, we are going to focus the real world uh, 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 anti-poverty program. Uh, there are two of them that we're going to we're going to be uh, uh, focusing on, uh, and we estimate that during and after uh, program effects, these two large-scale cash-based programs. And our main argument is that these programs are very very effective uh, in providing temporary relief in multiple measures of economic well-being that we assess in this paper. Uh, but the observed effects are not sustained and they disappear shortly uh, after the pro program cycle ends across uh, multiple outcomes that, that uh, we're going to be looking at. And at the end, and we spend a lot of time in the paper trying to explain why. Um, let me just give you a little bit, just a brief information on the programs that we study and the population. Uh, so we're going to focus on two programs. Uh, uh, they have very high transfer values. Uh, they're implemented by uh, UNHCR and WFP. Uh, one program uh, will provide over $2,000 per year per household, uh, spread over uh, on a monthly uh, basis. And another food uh, program will provide $1,600 per household. Uh, these transfer values are, are larger than most of the programs that are studied in the UCT literature. They're large in, in terms of uh, absolute values, but they're also large in uh, relative values that correspond to uh, almost half of the uh, counterfactual expenditure in uh, in our sample. So we do expect these these effect uh, sizes, the transfer size, to be sufficient uh, to uh, to have sustained effects. Uh, our population are are uh, forcibly 
displaced uh, Syrian population in Lebanon. Uh, they have uh, uh, they have similarities and differences with respect to the populations targeted by uh, by typical uh, unconditional cash transfer programs. Uh, then I'm going to just underline the differences here uh, to think about the implications of our results is is that they usually leave most of their uh, durable assets in the uh, home country. The, they're excluded from uh, formal institutions and formal labor market and formal insurance markets most of the time. Uh, they're recent mig uh, migrants, and they, they they had prior exposure to conflict, and they are actively still in the in the you know, sort of the conflict zone, um, and and they have lack of access to uh, formal credit uh, markets. They have high uh, discount rates uh, that might preclude savings, and and there's little insurance against the frequent shocks that they uh, they sort of uh, face on a uh, on a frequent basis. So our contribution is that we're gonna, you know, we, we for a wide range of outcomes, uh, well-being outcomes, we're gonna show evidence that UCTs are highly effective in improving economic well-being. And these findings are in line, uh, most of them with the existing literature. Uh, but more importantly, we show that these effects almost completely vanish in all the outcomes that we look within months after the, after the program cycle ends. Uh, we uh, investigate as to why we show evidence, strong evidence that this is really not myopic behavior. Uh, or, or the small transfer values. Uh, we also have opportunity to look at the term structure. We look at households who are continuously uh, 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 assisted versus who became nearly eligible. And we don't see much of a difference in, in the effects that we estimate. So we kind of rule out the, uh, uh, the, the term structure uh, uh, hypothesis as well. And what was left with us is that really the volatility and, and, the, and the future uncertainty of with respect to having being able to receive assistance another round or uh, uh, frequently, uh, fr uh, frequently receiving income shocks uh, uh, diminish the, the capacity and the effort uh, of these households uh, who are trying to save, uh, uh, save both cash and, and, and non-traditional durable goods. So we show that there is effort from these households to be to try to save uh, both in in terms of cash and and durable goods, but these savings are liquidated within months after the uh, after the program ends. Uh, this is an observational study, uh, but we still try to hedge against you know uh, a specification search through restricting the sample specifications, variable definitions, and the falsification tests prior uh, to our agreement with the implementing agencies in in. Uh, in Lebanon. So we, we kind of follow a, a study protocol. Uh, let me give you a little bit of uh, contextual information. Uh, the, uh, there are one and a half million refugees in, in Lebanon. Uh, 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 they're typical in the region, uh, large family size, uh, very young population, uneducated, and the median family uh, lives on $2 per day per, uh, per person. Uh, these cash-based transfer programs are, are, are mainly implemented UN and partners, UNHCR and, and, and its partners in the region. Uh, they, they reach, they, these are at scale programs, they reach to almost half of the refugee population and, and, and provide overall uh, $350 million on an annual basis. We're going to look at two programs. One is uh, the multi-purpose cash, which provides $175 per month uh, to the poorest uh, 60,000 households. I'm going to tell you how, how we define the poor. And then there's, an, there's a more generous food program that provides $27 per person per month as a value voucher to the poorest 120,000 households. Uh, pro programs are targeted by, by, by a PMT approach. So there's a prediction model that predicts the expenditure per capita for, or for the full population uh, of, of refugees in Lebanon. Uh, depending on the budget, uh, they both follow a bottom-up approach. So uh, they, as the budget allows, they provide assistance to the, uh, to the poorest predicted by this model. And then once the budget uh, is over, the next household wouldn't be eligible for, for this program on that specific year. Uh, the, these scores or proxy mean test predicted values or scores as they call it in, in the region, they can't be manipulated by refugees and even the uh, field offices wouldn't know the scores. There are a, a, a small number of people who, are, uh, who have access to these scores and they're guarded in centralized system in Beirut uh, in, the, uh, in the UNHCR headquarters. And here we just show a hypothetical example 
so so these programs are transfer values are large, and on the top of that, uh, they they actually overlap. So here you can see that you know we're uh, showing the the bottom sixty thousand, roughly speaking, uh, most vulnerable households according to the ranking, and a household of five individuals would receive both cash assistance uh, from UNHCR uh, and uh, uh, and uh, five people per $27 from food program. So this uh, uh, family would receive $330 per month uh, over a year up to a point where this is around 60,000 households where the budget of this program is over. Then, then the next uh, uh, family here will only be eligible for food, which is uh, $135. This is the first discontinuity that we are gonna rely on to estimate the intent to treat effects. And the second discontinuity that we, we're gonna be using will be, uh, this is around 120K households, which uh, moves from uh, receiving only food watches to, uh, to, uh, to not. So these are the two. So in other words, we're estimating the impact of one program and then additional impact of uh, uh, having access to uh, access to the uh, to the cash program by uh, by UNHCR and uh, and our estimates will reflect those uh, those coefficients. Uh, we use uh, an, an expenditure survey uh, conducted between 2016 and 2019. It's nationally representative of all the refugees in Lebanon. There are around 4,500 households per year. Uh, we link these uh, surveys to the administrative data that provides us the vulnerability and poverty scores uh, that assign eligibility for these, uh, for these programs. Uh, we have the entire score history of each household as long as they are, uh, they are present in, in Lebanon. For example, for, for a family who surveyed in 2019, we'll have a score going all the way back to 2016. And we also have the actual assistant history. So we do know that how much money is deposited to the account of, uh, of, of uh, the family by which program. And uh, we, we look at a, a wide range of outcomes. We obviously look at expenditure consumption by subcategory. We look at the child welfare, uh, we call it the child hardship index. Uh, that's a combination of uh, schooling, child labor, and child, early child marriage. And uh, we look at health and healthcare access, food insecurity, livelihood coping strategies, which is you know uh, living in low quality structure, exploitative work, and so on. And uh, and we look at additional outcomes to investigate this uh, consumption smoothing behavior, case savings, and and asset stocks. Uh, we observe households in the six months after the program begins. So we're going to observe them first when, while they're receiving the assistance uh, after six months the program, program begins. And we're going to have the second chance to observe them 18 months after uh, the, the, uh, the program starts. So that will be six months that the cycle is over. And even, even though these families were eligible for, for the prior year, they are currently, when we observe them, are not receiving uh, assistance. Uh, so, uh, so that gives us kind of the contrast between uh, between these two uh, time period observations. We're going to use a standard uh, regression discontinuity design. We're trying to estimate the intent to treat effects, and and we're going to use local linear uh, uh, functions to control for uh, for uh, the the trends around the threshold. And we're going to also use the survey fixed effects. I think everybody's familiar here with this approach, so I'm not going to spend for sake of time a lot of time. Uh, we have a battery of density test of manipulation and falsification and continuity tests that are standard for for uh, to uh, to uh, to validate the RD design. Um, uh, you know, for the, for the interest of time, I'm going to skip these tests. But but it looks like the uh, the uh, the RD design is a is a is a suitable one for the setting. So there are a couple of uh, uh, graphs that I'm that I follow. So maybe I spend a little bit of time trying to explain this. So on the uh, upper panel, we're looking at the multi-purpose cash program, and on the lower panel, we're going to look at the food program. Uh, the left-hand side here will show the uh, during program effects, and the right-hand side will show you the 
uh, after program effects. So what you see here is that you know the program works strictly uh, based on the eligibility score. So you can see this huge jumps, which shows that the difference of cumulative monthly average transfer between uh, families who are just right uh, below the threshold or above the threshold in terms of like poverty score to to be eligible for the program versus not. And here we go uh, we go back 18 months. Uh, so some of the families were reshuffled into receiving assistance versus not after after one year, but still, if you just count the average number of months by the eligibility score 18 months ago, you still see a substantial difference between uh, between the cumulative amount of assistance that families received for both programs. And here are, is our falsification test, which basically shows you that uh, your current uh, eligibility situation has uh, does not predict uh, your current uh, your uh, your uh, uh, your current uh, 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 your current eligibility your current transfer amount does not predict your uh, poverty score. Let me put it that way. So this is something that 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 has to hold for for our uh, study design to work. So here is the same setting. I'm showing you the consumption results. Uh, we find a 20 percent almost uh, a 20 percent increase in in consumption for the multi-purpose cash assistance program. And after six months, uh, this is actually, you know, statistically insignificant, but a negative effect. Uh, we find no effect uh, six months uh, after the program and the families revert back to their initial consumption levels. For the food program, the overall consumption, we do not find an effect, but there's a substantial uh, increase in, in food consumption because this is a, a food specific program. So this is kind of expected and also uh, zero consumption effect in the uh, six months after the, after the program ends. And I'm, we're gonna see like similar uh, patterns in, in each of the outcomes that I present. Uh, here, we're looking at the child hardship index. And this is again, a, a large kind of like uh, drop in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, index, which shows you that, that it improves child well-being on the order of 0 0.2 standard deviation. And then once the program ends after six months, we see nothing. And the same holds for the food program. We actually find no impact on child uh, well-being for the food program, uh, either during or after the uh, program ends. Again, cash assistance, we find across board no impact on uh, on uh, health and healthcare access. And this is due to the fact that UNHCR has a whole program that that uh, that facilitates the, uh, the, the health infrastructure for the refugees in Lebanon. And this is something that we somehow expect. Food coping strategies, again, you know, almost a 0 0.3 standard deviation improvement in food insecurity among those who are receiving assistance. And then six months later, uh, they revert back to the additional uh, uh, initial level and a little bit of impact for uh, for the cash program. Uh, finally, livelihood coping strategies. We find both programs improve the livelihood coping strategies. That that you know this is, these are day to day like coping strategies with poverty uh, among the refugees, but uh, but the program effects are again null uh, once the uh, uh, once the uh, once the cycle is 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 uh, is restarted. So. So then we ask why. Uh, so we have unfortunately limited measures on savings and assets. Uh, so uh, we ask, you know, there are questions that ask individuals whether they had any savings or whether they spend savings to deal with income shocks. And what we see is that during the program, uh, basically households try to save money. And these effect sizes are, uh, these effect sizes are again, uh, large, uh, on the order of, you know, we would see like 50% of increase in, in, uh, in, uh, in savings. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is around like a 30% increase in savings and an almost like 50% also increase the likelihood that they spent the money facing uh, a shock. So it's basically what you, what we what our intuition is that, you know, families are trying to save money, but in the meantime, there are somehow uh, we, that we cannot observe in the data set directly, but there are some income shocks that, that preclude them from this capacity of, of saving. And uh, we don't see much of an impact on, uh, on food program. And again, when we go back to the after program effects, you know, either the saving behavior or the, the to spend to cope with uh, uh, with income shocks is is identical for uh, for both uh, both uh, uh, beneficiaries and non beneficiaries for both programs. Now we look at finally we will look at asset ownership. 
Uh, so, so you know, this is like non-traditional form of saving since they 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 don't have access to uh, formal saving technologies, and and these are a lot of outcomes. So obviously, just we just look at the trends, you can see that these red lines just indicate that uh, families are actually trying to save durable goods. You know, they buy uh, washing machine, mattresses, motorcycle, ovens, and and things like that uh, while they they have money in their account, and then. Uh, and then once, and these are the green lines, and once the program is over and they're left with, uh, you know, uh, 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 without, uh, without this monthly uh, transfers, they, uh, they basically sell them uh, back to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the ownership probabilities are, are centered around zero, except a, a very imprecise washing machine here. And the same for the Food program, we see all these increases in durable goods uh, during program, and then and then the effects turn back to uh, mostly uh, uh, null after uh, after the programs end over six months. We look at the term structure, and we look at you know we can split the uh, sample into into two groups. Uh, one group are are families who are continuously receiving assistance. Uh, and here, what you see is that uh, these are the, the families who received assistance. Uh, they were previously eligible and they were discontinued uh, in the current cycle. And the effect sizes are identical for those uh, compared to families who have ever received assistance and they started receiving assistance just, at, uh, 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 just on that cycle. I'm showing you the result for consumption because those are like kind of the most clear ones, both for food and 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 multi-purpose cash, but uh, we see this pattern over and over again for uh, for for the other all the other outcomes that we uh, that we see. The term structure doesn't seem to make a uh, make, make a difference. We look at the myopic behavior. We don't see any increase, and this is already documented in the in previous studies. So. Uh, we don't see much of an increase in consumption of any of the uh, temptation goals. Children are taken out of school, they go back to school. So these are things that you would expect to kind of see a, see a sustained improvement, uh, kind of a long-term investments, uh, you know, cash savings uh, and, and purchase of durable goods, they all increase, but, uh, but, but again, uh, we don't see much of anything uh, remaining after, uh, after uh, once the family is becoming eligible. Um, so, and the, and, the, and the transfer size is not an issue, obviously, because uh, because these are really uh, uh, large programs in absolute and, and, and relative terms. So so what what's left to us is the most likely cases is we don't have the the full uh, full uh, direct evidence, but but the the most plausible case is that you know due to volatility and, and future uncertainty that they that the uh, refugees face. Uh, they're probably trying to the shocks kind of like dwarf the the saving capacity of of these families and and kind of the program effects kind of fizzle once uh, uh, once once they're over. So let me just uh, summarize. I think I'm still on time uh, since Martin didn't uh, say anything. Okay. Uh, so, so we use we use a common uh, feature, you know, the proximity test to identify the, the the during and after program effects of two high value uh, unconditional cash transfer program uh, uh, among uh, the refugee population in uh, in Lebanon. Uh, the one unique thing I think about the study is that it studies natural scale setting, and this is like how the programs are implemented, the 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 design, the the implementation and 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 the organization of the programs are are, are constraints within uh, within uh, within you know the the political uh, and the institutional infrastructure. There are similar programs that UNHCR uh, and WFP operates around the world. And what we see is that you know these programs actually are very effective in what they promise. They provide temporary relief. And, and improve the economic well-being during the time that uh, that they're provided, uh, but uh, but their uh, uh, their uh, kind of impact doesn't last or not sustain. In other words, we're trying to add to the to the debate on potential for cash transfers. They don't have at least in within our context, they don't seem to have long-lasting effects. Um, thank you very much. I think that's all I have to say, and I see a lot of uh, chat. Uh, here, but I'm hoping that Steve has uh, covered some of them. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. That was super interesting. Um, so now I guess for the opposite paper um, is Arlen and Juliana and Christian.
Okay, so thank you so much for sticking around. Um, my name is Arlen Gorin, and I'll be on the market next fall. And this project on reparations is joint work with Juliana Londoño Velez and Christian Pozo. So our big picture question is uh, related. So can cash transfer positively affect development? And in particular, can reparations for victims of human rights violations, that is monetary transfers that are awarded to recognize and address the harm suffered by these victims help them rebuild their lives. And the reparation programs have been carried out in more than three dozen countries from post authoritarian in Argentina to post-World War II America to post-conflict Indonesia. However, we have no quantitative evidence on the effects that these reparations may have had on the lives of those who received them and their children. So to shed light on this, we study the world's largest reparation program for victims of conflict which has been taking place and continues taking place today in Colombia and has already benefited uh, almost uh, 1 million victims. We're interested in understanding whether reparations can have long-term effects on victims' well-being and transform both their lives and their children's lives. So to do this, we use comprehensive uh, national level linked administrative and panel level microdata and both event study and before after approaches to estimate causal effects. So throughout the presentation, I'll show you evidence on how victims use these reparations to fund productive investments that are potentially going to have positive long-term effects, both on the current generation as well as the next generation. So today, uh, after describing the context, I will first show you impact on adult victims outcomes where I will focus on entrepreneurial activity consumption, land and home ownership, and health. And after that, I'll focus on the impacts on the children of victims, specifically their college attendance and their performance in high school. Um, so let me start with a quick background on Colombia's conflict and victims' uh, reparations. There are about 8.9 million Colombians that are considered victims of the internal armed conflict. That is, if you take randomly a Colombian, uh, there is a, around a 20% chance that that person has actually suffered from any some type of victimization. And chances are so high that out of the three Colombian co-authors that uh, this paper has, the one that is presenting today and his family is actually a victim of forced displacement. And unfortunately, uh, ours is not a right case and a right situation. We are not alone since other 8 million Colombians or 90% of all these victims are victims of forced displacement which makes for the largest number uh, and largest population share in the world, second only after Syria. This conflict uh, was widespread. Uh, it affected more than 90% of the Colombian municipalities. So in each of these 90 municipalities, we had at least one victimization uh, over the past three decades. And it also affected most brutally poorer and rural areas. Um, in these figures, we plot the number of victimizations over time. So what we can see is that since its peak in 2002, the number of victimizations has decreased over time with Colombia's attempts to transition into peace and reconciliation. The Colombian government has sought to help these victims. Uh, by, two, uh, by 1997, it began providing humanitarian aid to victims, which uh, as you will expect quickly generated a need to identify who had been victimized in the past. So the country started from then collecting data on victims which is one of the main data sets that we'll be using throughout uh, this presentation and, the, and in the project. Uh, by 2008, the government began a, a program to compensate victims with cash, uh, and specifically some victims whose relatives have been murdered and forcibly disappeared uh, uh, during the conflict. And importantly for us, in 2011, Colombia massively expanded reparations with the victims' law. This victim's law was ambitious. It aimed to award financial reparations to 7.4 million victims or 15% of the country's population that have been victimized over the past three decades by guerrillas, paramilitary groups, and state forces. And this reparation was designed as a one-time lump sum and non-means-tested cash transfer that was remarkably generous in magnitude, so it was up to $10,000 at the market exchange rate or over $26,000 at purchasing power parity. So for this population uh, that is particularly vulnerable, 
the average reparation received represents a three years of average household income. And much like a labeled cash transfer, reparations were presented to victims as if money to transform their lives. So victims were suggested, but not forced, which is important here, to use the reparation to create and strengthen businesses and it, it, to acquire housing or improve housing conditions and invest in post-secondary attendance. So today we will be taking a look on all these outcomes as well as additional outcomes that are, were not targeted, but they are important for this population. So by 2019, almost $2 billion or so 1% of the Colombian GDP have been paid out in individual reparations to nearly a 1 million victims. And what is key for our identification is that due to binding government and budget operational constraints, the rollout of this cash payout was both staggered and unanticipated by recipients. Um, so our event study approach will then leverage the time variation in the distribution uh, of these reparations and the surprise nature of this payout by receiving victims. The results that I'll be showing you today uh, are the result of merging eight different national administrative data sets and looking at different outcomes that document effects throughout the victim's life cycle. So I will show you that reparations transform these victims' lives. They improve victims' ability to have small businesses. They increase their consumption, especially their consumption of uh, durable assets, and they increase the probability of owning property. And they also help them to enjoy better health. While for the children of the victims, I will also show that the reparations improve their schooling outcomes. Uh, and so next, to examine these effects throughout the life cycle, uh, we, we start by studying um, uh, the effects for, uh, for adults. So uh, we start by studying whether reparations foster income generating activities like creating and strengthening businesses. So to look at entrepreneurship, we first um, uh, use data from Colombia's census of formal firms. So in Colombia, firms must obtain a license from the Chamber of Commerce. And this license is required for many regular activities, including access to credit, access to subsidy. And uh, these firms also, as long as they remain active, they are required to renew this license every year, which is also going to allow us to see firm survival. So in this figure, the y-axis plots the effect of the reparation on the livelihood of registering a new business in percentage terms relative to the base minus one, the period just before the event. So here as well, the x-axis plots um, event time and the red dashed line uh, marks the event. So the period uh, in which the money is paid. The coefficient we find uh, are not statistically significant before the reparation, which supports the parallel threat assumptions. But on the other hand, we find that uh, reparations have a sizable effect on formal business startup as proxied by obtaining a, a new business license with reparations being 37% more likely to register uh, with recipients of these reparations being 37% um, more likely to register a new business the quarter after receiving this cash, uh, this, this cash um, which suggests that liquidity may have been an important constraint to entrepreneurship as reparations seems to be helping victims afford the startup costs associated with starting these businesses. Um, reparations also inject capital into existing firms so they can also help existing businesses. And we find that inclusion uh, and the infusion of this capital increases firm survival measured as the likelihood of having an active business in a specific year. And this effect is immediate and remains large even three years after receiving the reparation, which reflects the importance of resource misallocation in context with binding financial constraints and the importance of these large cash transfers in terms of business survival. Um, in a related exercise um, where we study access and use of credit, we also find that the reparations uh, allowed victims to increase their use of microcredit in the intensive margin, which is again consistent with this story that victims use uh, the reparation to fund productive investments. We can use the same data set on access and use of credit to see how consumption of durable assets responds to the reparation. Here, uh, we find that reparations also rise out of loan debt, which is consistent with more car ownership. This effect is persistent and sizable in percentage terms such that 1.5 years after the cash disbursement, the coefficient is 35% and significant at the 5% level. And in line with more consumption in a related, in a related exercise, we also find that, uh, that victims have a more intensive use of credit uh, after receiving these, uh, of credit cards, sorry, after receiving these, um, these cash transfers, which is again in line with uh, increases in consumption. 
Now, remember that um, one of the messages suggested when di distributing the money was that the recipients should consider using it to buy a house. So to study home ownership, uh, uh, what we do is that we use the Department of Antioquia, which is actually the department where I am right now, and we use it as a case study. Antioquia provides an interesting case study as it accounts for 25% of the total number of victimizations, and it also accounts for 25% of the total amount, the total number of reparations that have been delivered in Colombia. Here for Antioquia, we have obtained access to the universe of formal real estate transactions, which takes information from all notaries in all municipalities, except the Medellin metropolitan area, which is excluded uh, from this data set. So this figure plots uh, the cumulative number of lump home or home purchases from 2010, which is the first year that we are able to observe in the data. And again, with, consistent with victims using this reparation to buy land or home, the cumulative number of land or home purchases increases by almost 17% two years after the house received the reparation. We run this at the national level with a, a similar data with, with a, the credit a access a data set and consistent with greater home ownership, at the national level, we find that an increase in uh, that, that the victims increase mortgages due to the reparation as well, which is consistent with this story of the acquiring housing. Um, next, we take a look on how many affect victims self. We use a data set on medical visits, diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, and other services for every patient in Colombia. An important thing to mention here is that due to uh, that the data set that we began running regressions on before uh, COVID, COVID adopted was a smaller random sample, but we are hopeful that we can reproduce these outcomes these, and these results and these figures with the full data set soon as we get uh, access to this full sample. But with this, uh, this sample, we see an immediate drop in the likelihood of having an emergency uh, department visit with compounding effects over time, suggesting money positively improves health. Most of these immediate drops come from reductions in conditions due to external causes. We take a look at diagnosis and, and we see that uh, they could be driven by improvements in work conditions, like shifting out of risky jobs, as well as improvements in living conditions, like having access to clear water, uh, water caused by receiving the money. But over time, by looking at diagnosis, we also see a, a lowered its emergency department visits um, uh, for other conditions such as circulatory and digestive system, digestive system conditions, uh, possibly due to whole improvements from better personal habits, like improving dietary habits, uh, changes in location, and, and, and those changes that one will expect to take longer to emerge. We also see drops uh, in the likelihood of hospitalizations on other set of outcomes uh, and the number of medical appointments over time, which is again consistent with improved health outcomes, thanks to the positive wealth shock from the reparation. Okay, so in the last minute that I have left, um, I want to show you the effects that reparations have on the children of the victims. Um, we start by studying impacts on college enrollment, where we use a, a national data set that tracks all students along the post-secondary education pipeline, pipeline. So in this figure, uh, for instance, we plot the likelihood of attending a, a four or five year undergraduate program for individuals aged 15 to 25 in a given semester before and after their household received a reparation. What we find is that there is a, a large and persistent increase in undergrad attendance after treatment. Part of this effect at event time one is driven by a gain in access with individuals applying to college and in being admitted in response to obtaining the reparation. So first time attendance, we, uh, we see increased by 24%, but the reparations also improve persistence in college. The enrollment gain rise uh, over time, such that two years after the cash payout, enrollment is 18% higher thanks to this reparation. Consistent with uh, the story of binding financial constraints, uh, these effects are larger at private uh, institutions rather than public, with private institutions in Colombia charging relatively high tuition fees, even when we compare them to the U US relative fees. So lastly, we study impacts on money of money on, on high school graduation and performance. To do this, we use microdata on Colombia's national standardized high school exit exam, which is mandatory and taken by all high school seniors around age 16. Um, because this exam is taken only once, uh, we do not use the same event study approach that I was using before. Instead, we compared outcomes for children whose families received the reparation before versus after they turned 16. 
So intuitively, the idea, the idea that we have in mind here is that if the reparation improves uh, uh, children's outcomes, we should see impacts for those aged under 16 who have more time until graduation, but not among older kids. We're going to serve here, uh, serve here as a placebo in these estimations. What we find is that reparations do not seem to affect the likelihood of graduating from high school. However, they do see to uh, induce the age at graduation, inducing students aged 17 and above to graduate earlier, uh, usually at age 16 and under. Moreover, as is plotted here in this graph, the reparation caused younger victims to improve their performance in the national standardized high school exit exam. That is, their academic performance improved thanks to the money. These performance gains are concentrated among children aged below 16, that is, those who have more time until graduation. And consistent with more money producing larger gains, these performance gains are increasing in the amount of the reparation received um, in this group. They're also driven by improvements in math scores rather than reading. Uh, for those who received above median sized reparations, the overall performance gain in math scores is 1.64 percentile points or 0.05 standard deviation, uh, an effect that is comparable to or that is between one third and one half uh, compared to that, uh, the one that the literature on value added finds for the effect of uh, increasing the teacher quality by one standard deviation. And this effect, once we plot it and we collapse this uh, effect of receiving the re reparation before age 16, is robust across a wide set uh, uh, of specifications, uh, we, uh, such as including year of birth fixed effects, exam cohort fixed effects, victimization type fixed effects, municipal municipality fixed effects, and a very dense vector of ex ante household and individual characteristics that we have at hand. Um, and usual, and, and they are also a robust to different types of specifications, linear regression, and actually uh, nearest neighbor matching, which we also use as a robustness check. We also study potential mechanisms driving this effect. Uh, we do not seem uh, by exploiting these uh, mechanisms that parents choose a different set of uh, schools for their kids after uh, receiving the money. Instead, the evidence that we find is consistent with behavioral effects that could uh, affect, say, uh, a student effort, uh, family conditions, aspirations, and, uh, and, and academic achievements, um, among others. So in summary, uh, we find that reparations do help victims to find productive investments throughout their life cycle. They foster entrepreneurial activity as recipients create more formal businesses, their businesses last longer, and they have a more intensive and healthy use of microcredit. Reparations also rise consumption in particular, we find an important increase in durable asset consumption with auto loans and land and home ownership increasing due to the cash received. And they also seem to have a positive effect on health with recipients having a less intensive use of the healthcare system um, uh, as, we, as, as I just showed you before. Regarding the second generation effect, so the future and probably longer term effects, we, uh, we find that uh, reparations also improve the high school performance of the victims, uh, of the children of these victims, and they also improve their college enrollment and their persistence. So to conclude, um, we evaluate the effects of the reparations by studying the Columbia's Victims Reparation Program, which awarded large cash transfers to hundreds of thousands of victims uh, of the Colombian internal armed conflict. And by linking rich administrative national level data sets, we find clear evidence that these cash reparations, which were large, have an impact on victims' lives as well as their children's lives with reparations funding productive investments. So recipients not only use the reparation to pay off all debts, but they also increase their consumption and invest in human capital and their, uh, and their investment in small businesses. And I see that I am close to hit the 20 minutes, but that's luckily all that I have for today. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks everybody. So we have um, 15 minutes for Q and A within the Zoom, and then you know we can migrate over to the sort of gather session where we can all chat sort of in smaller groups. So I hope to see you all there. Um, so Debra, do you want to kick off the questions? No, do do I? No, I'm 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 cool. Oh, uh, I I might as well. <laughs> no, in this last talk, I was asking Juliana actually. So um, this. This business of how much of these um, very interesting effects that you get 
are coming from a relaxation of liquidity constraints and how much from just a normal income effect that now makes you want to buy more goods. A good example is the housing, the auto, the auto loans going up, right? That suggests that, oh, okay, let me buy a car, right? And I, I was just wondering if there's a decomposition that you can achieve a little bit between the pure income effect and a liquidity constraint effect being relaxed. Thank you so much. Yeah, one of the things that we could do, and it's actually one of the things that we want to do in the future, is interact in these variables. So we can access the census of formal loans, which we actually exploit for some individual uh, cases. And we could, one of the uh, heterogeneous results that we could exploit is whether the households that didn't have access to any type of loan, like they didn't have access to microcredit or they were like uh, credit constrained in this sense, have like a higher t effect compared to those that didn't have this uh, access to the, to, to, to the to their credit and from a loan. I think that's one of the things that we could do to, to, to answer that. Let me come back to my question. It's mostly with the clarification. Is the moment that they learn that they'll get this lump sum uh, transfer the same as the moment that they learn that they are uh, classified as victim and hence eligible for longer term? Or they all already knew they were classified as victim and then the, 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 it's just the moment of the reparation that differs. Yeah, so they know way before that they are classified as victims. So actually, by the time that the victim law was announced, like there were already like 7 million registered victims of the conflict. And they only know about when they are going to receive the reparation one week before they receive it. So they receive a call and they say, and they, they tell them, um, you, you have this cash and this check that you need to collect. Uh, because you, you, you're going to receive it right now. What is important for us is that the, uh, the government is only able to uh, repair in a small share of the individuals each month. So that is less than 20,000 individuals. And there is this so huge waiting list that individuals are unable to predict when they're going to receive it. And actually anecdotal evidence and survey evidence from, uh, from, very, uh, for, for, from, from studies has shown that individuals, some of them, they don't even expect that they're going to be able to be uh, uh, compensated. And the ones that think, uh, think that the way in which I, the, the government is prioritizing this cash transfer is totally at random because the government hasn't been able to set priorities for uh, or like make the prioritization very clear for these individuals. So there is anecdotal evidence that this is actually a surprise uh, and they come as a surprise for these individuals. Yeah. So if we compare with the previous paper and just in general in the literature, the fact that these are households that are also eligible for uh, more general social transfers matters, I think, for the interpretation of the results. So the kind of the you know, they, they don't need to save it up uh, for consumption shocks because they, they know they have a safety net. Is that silence or is my audio off? Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was just like a like a super comment, but yeah, I I think that no, no, no. It, it, it is. I think we're all waiting. Okay. Devaj, yeah. I think people think you're yeah. sharing, and Unrila wants to ask something. So let me help the, the coordination here. Okay. Sorry, I don't know okay. if we're working our way down a list of unanswered questions still, or if I should go ahead. I have no unanswered questions. So. Oh, okay, great. I actually want to ask a question. Um, to Teresa about the first presentation. I want to go back to the issue of sort of like what is special about export manufacturing jobs in the sense that, I mean, if the key factor for why you're seeing these effects has to do with sort of the average age of, you know, the workers in a given sector, why not look at that, like look at variation based on like the average age of, uh, you know, the uh, manufacturing sector is present. I know you mentioned that arguably manufacturing, export manufacturing is less endogenous, but you're not really exploiting direct shocks to that. So, you know, why not also show if your effects tend to hold based on characteristics of, you know, the sectors more generally rather than honing in on export jobs? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And in fact, um, the project was kind of just motivated about based on labor market conditions in general. And we kind of ended up on export manufacturing because there was good data. You know, we are we thought it would be slightly less endogenous, but you're you're right. And I 
we can certainly do that. So I think, so are you, so I just want to clarify, you're suggesting like just looking at overall manufacturing, but uh, exploit variation in kind of the eight, the different ages at which people tend to go into. Yeah, so, so we, I, I actually hadn't thought of that. Um, I was just worried that overall manufacturing in general would be, would be tough to tease out, you know, the labor market affects them, but it, like some, something at the, some age variation, I think, I think we could push, push further on that. Yeah, yeah. like if the composition of manufacturing industries, you can exploit the composition of what sectors are present in a given location and if some sectors tend to employ younger people, you know, then you can exploit that dimension of the, mm -hmm. the composition uh, of manufacturing yeah. jobs. No, that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Actually, ex, ex, ex ante, we didn't know it was going to be mostly about this opportunity cost channel. But now that we do, I think, yeah, that's a great idea, I think. Can I ask something, uh, follow up on Wendrila? Is that OK, Martin? So, you know, this derivative, this derivative thing, I made a very quick comment on it. It's, it's sort of good because, you know, we have to get into the second derivatives on how curved the cost function is on mm -hmm. that. I was thinking, you know, I may be completely off on this, but maybe in the export sector with a preponderance of blue collar jobs, it may be that the baseline level of schooling is low. I was start, start chatting with Joaquin mm -hmm. about this. And yeah, so that's true. Yeah. Okay. So if you reported these results in terms of elasticities, that might actually help us organize our thoughts better. So like the baseline level of schooling mm -hmm. is lower, it goes up by a year, but the elasticity is still comparable, even though the absolute value of the derivative is lower. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. We haven't, we, we haven't done that directly. We totally can, um, and we will. The one, one thing that kind of indirectly gets at this is that I breathed by this towards the end of the presentation, but in some specifications, we allow for the treatment effect to vary by baseline schooling, and we find that it does. So treatment effects are smaller for people with higher baseline schooling, people and subdelegations. So we do it both ways. Um, so, so the results hold when we control for that, but that's not directly estimating the elasticity as you suggested, right, which we right. can also do, yeah. Thanks. So I'll jump in. So I have a question about the last two papers. For So for Owner and Steve, how, like, what are the refugees doing for generating income? Like, do, do they even have the opportunity to invest in productive assets? Would that be like a reasonable thing for them to do? So the most common jobs are in the informal labor market. There's a whole informal settlement area in Beka, which is occupied with agriculture. And those who uh, live in the cities, construction is a, is a big industry. We don't have the, the sort of like the uh, labor force uh, 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 statistics on, on the refugee population, but this is based on, you know, our kind of like uh, seeing the data a little bit from here and there and from the administrative data, what we see is, is, is basically uh, a lot of uh, informal wage to jobs uh, with uh, little entrepreneurship. Um, and we didn't, unfortunately, this was like an important question that we wanted to answer, but the, the, the wazir, the data that we use doesn't have that component where if the, uh, if family members are engaged in uh, 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 self-employed businesses or not, uh, we, we, we don't observe that in the data set, so we couldn't answer, but that's, that's, you know, that was the, one of the things that we couldn't, uh, uh, we couldn't document. Martin, I think that Hoyt is oh, everything. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, the, on the refugees or the displaced people, I wonder, is it possible there are perverse incentives built into the program such that people might not want to look like they're being too successful prior to being confirmed that they receive payment? Um, that'd be thing one. And, and then the other, I don't know if I would call it a perverse incentive, except it's one that you might impose upon yourself, which is I might wait to decide how I'm going to organize the rest of my life um, until I find out about this thing that I know is in the pipeline, such that the timing might be linked to it. That may seem like a weird psychological explanation, but anyway, two, the two at least seem possible. Um, so <laughs> these are, you know, is it kind of hard to, hard to answer. Uh, but the thing with the, with, the, with the way that these interviews take place is, is you know, we have joined some of them, uh, is basically at the beginning of the conversation with the family, it is conveyed that the survey has no bearing consequences on their eligibility for the next year or whether they're going to be receiving assistance in the, in the next cycle or not. And, and they make sure that uh, the, the family acknowledges that. And 
Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, the, the order of the questions are done in a way that it creates some kind of familiarity with, I mean, this kind of, kind of, some kind of bond with the family at the beginning. So the questions are asked in different ways and, and the, 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 the whole household is there. So at least my, you know, I can't, I don't, we don't have all these systematic data on this, uh, but it seems unlikely to me uh, that, that, that families would reflect their, uh, you know, uh, there will be some reporting bias based on their, uh, uh, their kind of uh, expectations, if I understood the question correctly. And for the uncertainty, I think most of the, and you know, with Arlen's paper, I think this kind of overlaps in a way that we do think that, I mean, we, do, we, we can't, we don't have a home run obviously in explaining this in the paper, but uh, I think uncertainty plays a huge role in, 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 in the way that the, the, the transfers work for the families because of the uh, fact that, you know, there are frequent changes in even their access to even informal labor markets. So it's not really clear month to month, even the capacity that you will be able to find a job depending on the, uh, the situation and the conflict zone and the government's response to, to the refugee inflows would change over time. So there's a lot of volatility. Uh, there, there is a, a number of, you know, uh, income shocks that are specific to refugees to the political context that are not uh, specific to, to, the, to the usual vulnerable populations that we observe in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in countries where the typical UCT programs are implemented. Um, the other thing is that, you know, families do not know uh, until uh, towards the end of the cycle whether they will be receiving assistance in the next cycle. So it's kind of makes it difficult for them to actually smooth consumption uh, and, and, uh, and decide like make like longer term adjustments in their, uh, in, their, in their consumption. And although also obviously there's this whole thing about the temporary protection where, you know, we have zero access to not only uh, to most of the markets in the host country, but uh, there's also little information to what extent the temporary protection will extend to, uh, uh, to the future. So I think there's a story about like a big part of the story is about uncertainty and inability to save and cope with uh, income shocks, but uh, we are kind of limited in the data that we have uh, to answer uh, all of these aspects, but plausible. Uh, thanks for thanks for all of your comments and, and for participating. Uh, before, before we finish, I, I want to thank the staff at DRI for making this like incredibly smooth and, and easy for us, and in particular, um, Faizan Kisar and Zahin Haq, who you know, kept track of, typed all the questions because in Zoom you can't copy and paste. Yeah. And just Thanks for the everything super smooth. Fucking... So I really appreciate the help from a lot of people that you didn't actually get to see. Um, and so hopefully we'll see you in the Gather Town. Uh, Great. Yep. Thank you for organizing. <laughs>